Oh. Oh, good lord, I cannot say that. I cannot say that. If I say that, I will be... I will be run off you. <laughs> I can't say that. Oh, so don't think. Oh. Hey, caramba. Hey, caramba. Hey, 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 hey. Ah. Oh. Oh, good lord. <laughs> Oh, Ren, pop out the chat. Yup, pop out the chat. Pop out the chat. Li go to live chat. <clears throat> I want the timestamps on. I want moderator activity, timestamps, and I want a Q&A start. Engage with the audience. Start a Q&A. Yes, start a Q&A. What do I want as my Q&A? Naval history questions. Please keep to the history. Please keep it cousin friendly. Little cousin friendly. <laughs> oh. Yeah, da da da. Da 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 da. Ba da da ba. Ba da da ba. Ba da ba ba. Ba da da da. Hello! Well, that's that's gone wrong. It's da 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 da. Yeah da 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 da. Hello. Da 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 so, actually, at the one point this day, I ha did manage to actually get it to focus in on Danger Mouse's face rather than my own face, so we'll see what happens. Ba da 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 how are we all now, everyone? How are we all doing today? Is it the third or the second day? It's the third. Oh, good lord. Oh, frigger, that could be problematic. Oi, Kurumba. So, we are hoping, everyone, we're crossing fingers tomorrow, that the royalties paycheck arrives at the right time. Because I've got bills going out for insurance and various things tomorrow. It's all supposed to arrive on the same day and go out on the same day. So, we're all hoping that's all right. Cross fingers, everyone. Joys of academia. Although, to be fair, I could do that, Matt. I could. Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? I'm just getting the window capture set up correctly and making sure I've got the uh, proper questions. Hey, that's in the right place, broadly speaking. No, I don't want to move that. I want to move that. Thank you. Move it up a bit. That'll do. And maybe make it a little bit narrower. And that's good. Let's lock that in position, shall we? And also, we're going to lo uh, lock the video capture so that doesn't move around. <laughs> oh. Hello, everyone. Hello. Right then. That can go to there. That can go to there. Hello, everyone. Is it better to call it the Night 6831 request a naval Q&A at this point? Well, no, Verdun, because you've beaten Night 6831. <laughs> oh, God, and he's got 80 questions. <laughs> uh, look, I'm going to do a new, a new rule. And this is to challenge everyone else. And this is not because... This is this. Night 6831 has 80 questions. I will answer one of his questions, one of their questions, for every one question answer for everyone else. So if you want to see all 80 of Night 6831's questions, then everyone else between them has to provide 80, 80 questions as well. Books look suspiciously neatly stacked. These are two of today's books. I do have, I always have six books here, but the whole rule is I have to catch up with the questions and I have to actually answer some questions before I can start talking about the books. So, I like books, like questions. I know. I do too. You, you should be getting video. 
You should be getting video. Yubari. I, Jen, Yubari. Um... What exactly are you wanting to question about this interesting interesting variation on a light cruiser produced by the Imperial Japanese Navy? Um, and if the questions appear in the that, I will I will answer them, of course. Um, if there was another planet like Earth that orbited just opposite of us, and a life similar to the Cretaceous period. What in where in theory could we land on the planet? Cretaceous period. Um, poles. Probably the best spot for us to land would be the poles. If it's got if it, theoretically you can land anywhere that you've got a high enough powered rifle, um, but I don't have a weapon <laughs> to deal with the deal with the life. But if you want to avoid the life, you probably go for the poles, where it's probably going to be co cooler. What can you say about naval guns used on land and tanks during World War One? Um, it's again, as a rule, it's usually heavy artillery. And if they are using, they they're not using full naval guns on tanks, but they are looking at a lot of their quick firing breach mechanisms for tanks because they want to have quick firing guns for land combat. But they are not they're not naval guns. It's like, I, I, I had an interesting conversation with someone recently who was going, oh, this is the same gun as they were using on the ships. And I'm going, no, on the ships it's, well, let's say, if I'm going to do it proportionally so you can see it, be that long. On the tank it's about that long. There's a difference. These two things are not the same. Andrew Bofford, the unfinished German World War One battle cruiser, the Erzat York, was laid down at Vulcan, Hamburg, Sydney, first of in 1916. Is this information correct? Um, let me check my own. <laughs> Erzat's York. Search my documents. Yeah, da 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 dee 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 dee. I think that's in one of the key ships, isn't it? That is in one of the key ships, and I have the information. Let me open up my notes and find the Erzat York. Uh, Leon, uh, that's the Alsace class. That's the Erzat Monarch class. I'm afraid of the Erzat York because I remember complaining about people's assumptions based on uh, ideas of what the Germans should have, were planning on doing, as if it was a doctrine when it was a reflection of their engineering capacity. And that's the Sadlitz. No, I did. Uh, I did. I have done Erzat York. I am sure I've done the Erzat York. Uh, that's that. It's that. So it's the Soyuz. That's the H class. Dutch Dream of 1913. Number 2013 class. The Never Built Supers. The Incomparable, which is not really that great. Mm. There's that Monarch class. Okay, okay, let's go to the next one. Key Ship 7. Yeah, da 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 da. Dante Alighieri, Alsace, uh, uh, Flower Class, Batch 1s. Uh, Boxer. I am sure I've done the years at York. If I haven't, I will do it, but I will. Let's, let's go for uh, that. York. Um. Do, 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 do.
Now, you have put the question as, uh, was the as at York's laid down on the 1st of July 1916? I have a question mark on that because I have it listed in free sources in front of me now because I found my notes on Urzat York. So I have obviously either done Urzat York as a key ship or intended to do Urzat York because I found it in my key ship notes. And I have one source says July 1916, one says 1st of July 1916. And one says 10th of July 1916. So I'm going to go with definitely right on July. And I'd say if you're you're probably reading the source that said 1st of July. And considering there's one other one, another one says July. I'll go with yes, 1st of July is correct. Broadly speaking. John Shea, in a thumbnail of HMS Revenge... Uh, Key series eight, key ships eight, season uh, series uh, ship four. Why is there everything you do a battleship that isn't war spider around? You look like a psychopath or sociopath or even both. It's both funny and weird. I have no idea why YouTube chooses the thumbnails. I just let YouTube choose the thumbnails. I have never done thumbnail design. Any t you well actually no, I have. You can always tell when I've done thumbnail design because it won't be an image from the video uh, from the video. It'll be something I have artificially created. And the only times I've done that have been when I've been really depressed by the photo they've chosen. Jacob, I spent a week in the woods, but where did the other European powers get their shipbuilding wood from? And so, if they didn't have a special Navy forest that was set up like the UK. Um, well, the Danish did have, did try setting something up. Uh, so did the Swedes. They also had forestry management systems. The French had various thing programs start. The French just keep going in and out of different programs. It's kind of like when I was talking about squadron organization and the US Navy. Um, you can tell, you can say the French have that program and they do have a program like the British for a time. And then they don't for a time. And then they come up with a new idea, which is also a theoretically a national program. They have it for a time. They just keep changing their ideas of what's what and who's doing what, and it gets quite weird and causes trouble. And it's the same with most powers. They either try and buy the wood on the open market and try and have it maintained as almost a capitalist function, or they try some sort of deal with nobility, or they do try and actually have a national service. And when I say capitalist function, it's... it's it's kind of interesting because they're trying to buy... And some of those powers are... This is one of the problems for Venice. Is they're often trying to buy the wood from people who are not Venice. And who... It's not necessarily in their best interest to provide Venice with high quality wood for warships. But also... Um, sometimes they're also buying the wood from Britain. Because Britain at several points is producing more wood than it needs. So it takes the best wood... And then they sell they sell off the wood they don't need, which also explains some of the quality of the ship, other ships built. Hello, Jack Ray. I was going to send you a message today because I haven't heard from you. Uh, I, I, you know, I was I have to admit, Jack. And hello, everyone. I'm going to go through the hellos, but with Jack. Usually, I get a question sent through to me on on Discord about once every few weeks or so from Jack. And if he doesn't send me a question, I go, is he okay? Or is he very, very busy? And should I check in with him? It hasn't... Uh, so far, the, que the, the the recent question hasn't come in yet. He's got a little time before he's expecting it. But I was going to go... Getting ready to do a Discord mes message to go, Jack, are you okay? How's life treating you? So I'm going to ask that here, Jack. How's life going and how are you treating it? Uh, anyway. Hello, Paul Amos. Hello, Just Funk. Hello, Frank Bamwell. Hello... Steve Clark, Leslie Mitchell, hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Carl Van Gasberg. Hello, Senna Canary. Hello, nice to see everyone. Hello, Tanner Verka. Hello. Oh, everyone who's on. There's so many. DG40, Malaga. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, Frame15. Hello. Alistair Crow. Hello. Hello, everyone. Let's see. Anyone else? David Goulding. Hello. Stephen Richards. Hello. Are we all doing fun? We are doing hello, John Shea. Hello, Peter Dawson. 
Well, it's all, it's, everyone's here. Oh, there's a good, there's a good crowd. Hello. There are 44 people watching. Hello, everyone. Hope you're having fun. All right. So. Nice, Aaron. What I want to know is, Adrian Yerbury is, is, is trying to be for the IJ and what Adrian Enterprise was for the Royal Navy. And was uh, Yerbury too small to be both viable crews for a test ship? Um... Yes and no. Okay. Theoretically, she works as a test bed ship. But one of her problems, and I would say this is a small problem, is that when they were testing and designing her, and they are playing around with her options and her and the ideas for her. They almost didn't go far enough. They have six 5.5 inch guns. In a twin, two twin turrets and two single turrets. And if you think about it, they could have gone with three turrets, two to, uh, two twin forward and a twin aft, and they'd have been perfectly fine. And they'd have probably saved weight and made it more efficient. They could have then worked out what they need to do with their torpedo tubes, their mines, etc. If you remove the gun from the lower deck, from the main deck, aft, you do make things for mines, torpedoes, all sorts of things a lot easier. So what I would say is the trouble is they're doing a test bed, they're doing a test bed but they're going almost too conservative because I think if they made it work and if they managed to make it work a bit more because basically what they're doing is building a supersized destroyer let's be honest yuvari if you haven't seen yuvari i will i will save her picture and da 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 <laughs> that's february 2023 i need i need 2024 where's my ah, there's march 2024 and i need Ba -ba -da -da -de -de. Browse. Where is Yubari? Yubari should be here. I just saved her. Two here. That's pictures for Nick. That's going to the wrong fault. <laughs> that would explain why she's not there. That would explain it. -da -da -de 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 -de. So, if we consider the Yubari, here she is. She's a good-looking ship, but you sit there and go, why are you doing the two single mounts? Why? Yes, you've got that funnel structure, but to be honest, you could count your superstructure a little bit back over the funnel tubing anyway. You could have moved that slightly further back. You could have then put a twin forward. You'd then end up with something which was not too dissimilar to a Leander. And you'd have plenty of torpedoes. You basically are designing a supersized destroyer, a long, uh, you know, or a very long-range fleet destroyer. And if it'd be me, I'd have then started pumping them out. If I'd been the Japanese, in this period, because Yubari actually has, she's almost thirty-five knots. She's capable of almost thirty-five knots, thirty-four point nine, I think. With a little bit of work, you have a thirty-five knot ship. Thank you, Jack Ray, for memberships. Thank you. Let's see if she's okay. Nope, just still just said hello. I'm I'm waiting for a response of whether you're okay or not. Um, just below thirty five knots. Has five point six five point five would ha if it had six five point five inch guns, um, in three twin turrets. You've got a lot of firepower, a lot of capability. You've got a fairly decent light cruiser, especially if you're deploying them in horde numbers. And you do this after the Washington Naval Treaty. You do this before, therefore. The London uh, before the London Naval Treaty because she's she's laid down in June twenty two, and commissioned in nineteen twenty three. They could have kept building and churning these out, and by the time it comes round to the Washington uh, London Naval Treaty, they're just going well. We don't want to lose any ships we built. I hope you get some rest then, Jack. Um, that's the thing. Now, I would say they don't have the greatest... Uh, it doesn't have the greatest armor profile or anything like that, but it doesn't meant to be. This is basically one step up from a destroyer. It having any armor is an advantage. 
Because again, you think about it the, this scenario. Let's say you build enough of these that you have four or five of these in the service. If you have four or five of these in a unit together. And they end up against four American destroyers. Five of these versus five American destroyers. Or eight of these versus eight American destroyers. The American destroyers probably lose that fight. It doesn't take much armor. It doesn't take much of a size advantage to make that fight winnable when you are basically a lot supersized destroyer. Honestly, it would have been the easiest way to really radically change London Naval Treaty. But they didn't do that. They went conservative and then they weren't happy with it. And I will expand it out for people to see, to have a look at. Probably bring this up there. There you go, so you can have a proper look at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that goes. So. Um. So basically, she wasn't too small to be a viable test bed, a cruiser and test bed. She was too small to be... Uh, they tried to be too clever with her when they did the testing her. Developing her. Um, nice to different. What are, okay, I'll answer that question. Um, Black Master, sorry, the question was more about time for landing the planet. 70s, 80s? Oh, if there's a planet in mirror orbit to Earth. In a mirror orbit to Earth. It doesn't matter if it's in the Cretaceous period to compared to us at this point. We would have gone there. We would have gone there a long time ago. It would have been a driving effort to get there. Um, the honest question becomes, how long does it take us to get there? And it, the, the sheer level of impact it would have on international relations. Because, you see, for if you were thinking about it, from, the moon was tempting enough. And it was felt that that possibly didn't have... It was worked out quite quickly that might, that would not have atmosphere. But a planet which had Earth-like conditions in a mirror orbit to us, let's say nearly a year's orbit, near the 300... Let's say roughly 350, 360 days, or days to orbit around the sun a year. You know, for the, we could go for it, it's a mirror orbit exactly of us and similar size with water and all these things so it's it would be something we'd be heading for and if you think about it from the perspective of going to and from it it's actually quite easy because you go off and you head away from which over you, you basically you head counterclockwise so if we're let's say the yeah, we're orbiting the sun that way, and the planet's orbiting the sun that way, then the quickest way you could get a take off and probably be there within three months' journey. And three months, it'll be three months either way, probably. Le most, uh, quite probably less. If we manage to accelerate enough. But, you know, with the fact that if you're going that way, with enough velocity to break from Earth orbit, so you are from the Earth, so you're going fast and at the pace of Earth, basically, through space. You're, you're breaking Earth's orbit. Um, and they're coming towards you. The other planet's coming towards you. Yeah, it's probably going to be roughly three month or so journey. Now, technologically, there are some things which are going to take more time than others. Uh, rocket fuel, etc., all these things. But you could well be looking at 60s, 70s. 1960s, 1970s, but you could also be looking earlier. It depends how much effort. Let's be honest. Um, 
getting to getting communism to another planet, getting fascism to another planet. Could be a very tempting target for certain powers. Who are willing to take all sorts of risks and throw all sorts of things at it. So yes, I have no doubt humans will be there. Also, with something which you don't need to really terraform, you have got roughly, you have got oxygen roughly, you know, the in the Cretaceous period it was a breathable atmosphere. Um, from memory, I'm just checking up. What was a Cretaceous breathable atmosphere? Uh, Relatively warm. Yeah. It's it's fair. Yeah, we we could you humanity could us could survive in that range. We'd be slightly on the warm side, but we could survive. Mirror planet 180 degrees ahead or behind would not be a stable orbit. Not really, but that's the question. You could sort of, it can be mirror ish, if you know what I mean. So, anyway, Handball was the armor for merchant vessels in the later age of sail. Not that important, but I used to like to carry something. That's the whole reason for carronades. It gives them some. It feels like they have something, but let's be honest, if they find themselves up against a full on warship, they're in trouble. But it's something which basically may, means most privateers go, we'd rather not to deal with that. Pirates and privateers go, no thanks. Are you surprised at how nice looking the Austro Hungarian Navy was? Not really, because they tend to be the types who do things. Austro Hungary is a type that they don't want a large navy, but they want it to be a well a well built navy. Uh, Mark Harkness. So, in World War II, the US and uh, erroneously reported the existence of IGN carriers Kuru and Ria uh, Kaku. Are there other instances of navy attributing such phantom ships to their opponents? The German Navy attributes so many phantom numbers to the Royal Navy. I mean, the Royal Navy, if you look at some of the German stats on the Royal Navy, uh, they decided Ark Royal must have sisters, and that's how they kept sinking her, and she kept being alive. That's the thing. That, that That's what they basically decide at certain points. It, it's quite interesting, humorous what's going on sometimes in some things. Um, and the British spend quite a lot of time looking for a fourth, um, for another Admiral Hipper. When there isn't one. Black Masters, if Germany decided to build a coastal battleship instead of the Panzer Sheaf, what would it look like and be armed with? Well, honestly, that's to say what the Panzer Sheaf are. But basically, what would it look like and want to be armed with? It's going to have far heavier armor, far less, en uh, far lower speed, and probably look kind of something like some of the Swedish ships being built at the time. Swedish have basically the closest to a coastal battleship being constructed in that period. Hey Richards, important history is on about doing some collaboration videos. If asked, would you consider doing a video with them? Yeah. I have a standing rule. I'll do a video with anyone if they ask me, and I think, and it's for it's going to benefit history and not make. I'm not going to spend the whole time sounding like a, do a douche. Excuse the French. Um. Mainly because the thing is, let me just wait. My my only scenario where I would turn down a video is where I'm going to spend the entire time telling someone they're wrong. Because there's no real point in that, or whether they want to have a they want to pick a fight the whole time. Because if I'm going into video with someone who's trying to make the case, I don't know that Nazi Germany had the greatest navy of all time. It's just going to turn into a slangy match. There's no point in me going on that video. It's like, I keep getting sent videos 
um, where an American is basically talking about how great German tanks and systems were, and I, he's apparently a college professor or something. I'm not sure what, but it, it's just, I'm just l looking at him going, yes, and why are you sending me these videos? Shouldn't you respond to him? No. No. I am not a T-boo. I am not aware. I am definitely not a aware boo. I'm not a... I forget what the American one is called. I'm going, I'm going to try and remember the American one at some point. Or anything. I'm a historian. <laughs> First rule of history. Don't go looking for perfection. You won't find it. Human beings have never been, were never, and will never be perfect. Why? Because we're human. And to be human is to be imperfect. And that's the wonderful thing, because sometimes it's the imperfections which make someone perfect for the role they find themselves in. It's Winston Churchill in World War II leading Britain. Yeah, many imperfections in that gentleman. But those same imperfections are one of the reasons why he makes such a good wartime leader for the UK in that period. Out of all the other options available... There are many who have less imperfections, or different imperfections than him, who are options. But their imperfections don't line up with the needs. His, you know, they might be better than him in some areas. They certainly are. But they aren't the imperfections that are needed. Next one. If Italy joins the Central Powers of World War One in 15 and UK cancels Gallipoli, France, Italy hold each other down in, nor in northern mid. So UK fleet is aimed to hold up the austro hungarian fleet. Who wins between Queen Elizabeth, uh, two battle cruisers versus the four Tenga uh, Tegadovs? Um, you've missed off quite a lot of the British strength. The British will also have the Lord Nelsons there. And quite a few other pre dreadnoughts So that's the thing. The British... Honestly, Queen Elizabeth is going to have an advantage, is going to have the capability of doing a lot of damage to them. So don't count that out. The battle cruisers, if they use properly, can cause trouble. But with the number of pre dreadnoughts the British will have, they will also be part of the fight. And the British will... It won't be a... You're doing a, the scenario, Frank, which I see a lot, where people are imagining a scenario... Where it's a portion of fleet versus a portion of fleet. It'll be the full fleet performance. It'll be the full fleet operation. And the British won't have a theoretically as strong a dreadnought force. But their overall force will more to make up for that and provide the strength to, to provide them with the uh, to overwhelm. Especially as they will call in more strength. So you'll probably find town class cruisers will appear like anything. Freedom boo. Ah, freedom boot. Okay. Rocket equation ruined... Uh, the rocket equation ruined everything. It ruins so much fun. French is a weeboo. I thought French of uh, uh, French were Napoleon and uh, Napoleons. Napoleonics. Actually, I spent uh, sorry. But I, have I bought Galactic Civilizations for yet? No. But that's because, in the nicest way, should know that. Well, explain this. The money comes through in my account. If you give through, let's say, Facebook. Facebook, no, not say Facebook, YouTube. Oh, get my brain right. YouTube comes in on roughly the 23rd of the month. Anything after the 23rd will not show up till the following 23rd. <clears throat> Patron comes in on the 6th. I also used to have pay I also have paychecks which come through at various points on the tenth of the month and the twenty sixth and the twenty eighth of the month as a rule. I like to have multiple paychecks. 
It makes my accountant unhappy. <laughs> so, um, Nitron, I'm not sure if you missed my question on the Argent calls being skipped above. above. I think you might also miss Timmy Locker. Let me go up and see. Um, there we go. Sign of a simple one, though. Maybe one Drac will be better place out. If Argent Call did have triple 15 instead of 6, uh, 618, how many turrets do you think it would have had? Three. I think whether you go, and unless you are really changing the hull design, you can either go with six eighteen inch guns or three a uh, three triple fifteens. So it's nine fifteen inch guns. And take a look at how many cases were there in World War Two where a new non command uh, chain officer was in was change of ship, even when there would be an officer. A non-command chain officer was in charge of a ship, even when there would have been an officer that was on the line of command, like USS San Francisco in Guadalcanal. Um, it depends. There's a C if they had a senior officer aboard ship, it can be interesting. It depends who. It, it depends what happens. It depends what happens to the officers aboard the ship, because there can be the chain of command on the ship can go. Da -da -da -da, that will go down to the lieutenants, etc., and all the things. But if you have an officer on board who's, let's say, a full captain. Then it's unlikely that the junior lieutenant, but despite them being in the chain of command, will take command. So it happens, but it it depends. If you had two officers aboard and one was a lieutenant and the other one was a lieutenant who was, let's say, the next senior officer uh, who was supposed to take over the chain of command was the chief engineer, and the ship is engines are in are having issues, then probably again the lieutenant will take command, who's not the chief who's not the chief engineer. And the chief engineer will tell him, you're in charge, I've got to keep these engines going. Because you're not an engineer, but I can keep these engines going. You have to command the ship. And we'll sort out the paperwork and all the other stuff later, sort of thing. That There are scenarios where that happens. But if your chief engineer is a lieutenant commander and the only officers aboard are left alive are lieutenants, then they have to take, go and take command because they're the experienced one. Sorry, they have to go and leave a trust and trust the lieutenant to do the job of running the engines. Hopefully they'll train them right. If you've got, though, a full captain, or there's even one example where a commodore ends up being captain of their ship, basically. Commodore's aboard. Commodore is... Don't think the ship is part of their group. Captain, command crew, everyone other than the senior engineer get injured enough that they are not they're not walking wounded. They are so they they are lying down in the the uh, de facto medical space wounded, and basically you have the commodore running the ship, taking over as the captain. And there is a whole question in the I think it was the Royal Navy after was going. Why did you not let the senior engineer take command? Well, let's see. The senior engineer was a very good engineer. We had a hole in one of the engine rooms. So, frankly, he was needed in his job running the engines and making sure they stayed float. And, uh, well, I am a Commodore. It was technically my ship. Uh, Frank Spartan, how well would the narrow zoom model on? Where would they be placed and how would they be used? Is Jellico happy with them? Jellico is very happy with them. They would be, if they were available early enough to be used in in um, the Battle of Jutland, they would have probably been placed in the same battle group with things like HMS Revenge, uh, in that sort of same sort of squadron, first battle squadron. And probably would have been blasting happily away. He would have been very happy with them because he'd have had more. He'd have had 16-inch gu uh, Those guns would be nice and big and scary, and he'd have been enjoyed wrecking some people with them. And they're also very heavily armored, so you could put them at the head of the line and see. And they, they would take a lot of damage quite happily and keep going.
Um, that was a couple of HMS victories sent back just a few years before the Spanish Armada with no guns or ammo. A, a complete HMS victory? What do the English should do with it? Change to any future ship designs. Um, they learn a lot about naval architecture. Uh, a lot about naval architecture from watching her. And try and fit it with guns. Try and fit it with guns. If they do, they'll have the largest, most powerful warship in the world. Um, operating her will be a nerve of a nightmare, but, you know, there's people uh, people like Drake around. They'll figure out a way. Henry Bradford. Was Ursa Nazanau started at uh, Jonworth Kill at so 8 and when? Um, that's a debate. And when she was started, she was. I think she was started because a lot of the discussions do talk about her being started, but actual date, I've seen multiple of them. So I'm not 100% sure on that one, Hendrik. Black Mask was. What if all type, 25, type 45s are built in the largest hull design used? Largest hull design was used. Uh, they would have had a 96 cell VLS forward and a 48 cell strategic VLS aft. So they would be able to carry, they would have 48 Mark 41 VLS tubes and 96 for their surface to air, which would have given them a capacity of 144 missiles. That gives them a lot of firepower. They would be able to carry two Lynx helicopters. They would have had three phalanx systems. Uh, done and done. So basically a, tri a trifactor. And um, they would have had the, the 4.5 inch gun forward. Not much increase of crew, but a little bit increase of crew. Uh, good endurance. They'd have had far more. They'd have had far more engine power, so they wouldn't have had the problems they've had with that um, power supply. And if they don't have all twelve, then Britain would have had twelve of the best destroyers for the last twenty years. And currently, we would not. We would never. We'd probably also have a scenario going whereby. If they had kept them going and they kept the you know the Type Twenty Threes going etc. as they have been, Britain would have twenty five escorts as a fleet to fall upon, and that would be a very different force than the modern one, uh, than what we forgot. It would have given us twelve solid escorts to do general purpose duties. Add in probably the capacity to take. I think they were planned out the capacity to take sixteen harpoons. If they're built and completed with that as well then you end up with a capacity of 160 missiles and that thing can rock it can turn up anywhere and go hmm so with the 48 uh, mark 41 vls cells those could be loaded with asrock though or, or subrock um they could be loaded with tomahawks loaded with sm3s and they probably would be they probably are loaded with a mixture of those for those because it would just make sense to be so probably um Eight of the anti-submarine ones, sixty, uh, 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 probably twenty-four Tomahawks, and sixteen of the uh, SM threes. Mankuj, Admiral Bing was executed for not being doing his utmost. However, in respect to it, given his force and strategic situation. How good bad was extra performance? It was okay, but it wasn't what I expected at the time. He had the bad misfortune of coming in at the wrong time with it. But frankly, he'd had mucked up. So, yeah. That's the thing. It's not that bad, but is it, it's not that bad. But it's bad enough that he can't use politics to get out of it, which he tried, which actually made it a bit worse. What if the London Naval Treaty has destroyers at 2,000 tons and destroyer leaders at 2,250 tons standard? What changes and how does it impact travel class? Travel class end up with about four, with the 4.7 inch guns in the dual purpose turret. And that's what they end up with. You have an extra theoretical 250 tons to play with, you can do that. And you probably possibly end up with some extra torpedoes as well, but it's going to be the turrets which are going to be the big thing. Which is going to change a lot of other things for those to, those destroyers' performance. I say, had 11 of the 26 Russian pre-dreadnoughts not been sunk in the Russo-Japanese War, how's the fact that dreadnought construction? 
doesn't help them a jot. Actually, though, actually, possibly puts a good person in more trouble because a lot of their investment in their yards is driven by the poor performance of their the pre dreadnoughts in the Russo Japanese War. So, actually, that could have a negative impact on it. Frank Sonoff, what are your favourite destroyers from Model 1? It's going to sound like a broken record, but the Tribal class. So, Donson, your family raised it. You fought some Sweden during NATO. And the joy the RM would have if the Bolt Tuck was the facto allied like at the time of World War Two. Uh that would have made the British very, very happy if the Baltic was a de facto allied lake in World War Two. It would have basically stopped the Germans from being able to do anything in World War Two. As it is, uh Sweden joining Sweden joining NATO is a very good thing for NATO. It's going to ground it a bit, but it's also it's adding in a net provider. Both, uh, both Sweden and Finland are net, um, net goods for NATO's strength, and especially for NATO's ability to defend us in depth. If you consider it, the Baltic states were always a bit of a issue to work out how to defend them. With Sweden just across the Baltic from them, with Finland now above them, etc., and releasing all these strategic scenarios, you've given them a far, you've got a far greater security and you've got far more strategic depth. If you've got air bases in Finland, in Sweden, uh, the, the aircraft can be over the Baltic states very, very quickly from Sweden. And that's a lot of defensive depth for those air bases. So... It... Basically provides a lot more security. It also provides a lot more security for Norway, and really does strengthen the northern flank. But it also makes the northern coast even more important because, with the Baltic becoming such a NATO, and I do agree to extent with the phrase NATO lake, then for the Russians the northern fleet becomes even more important. The Black Sea fleet is basically. The Black Sea Fleet is getting null, uh, is getting null from the inside out at the moment. Um, there, there are a lot of problems with trying to operate a major fleet in the Black Sea, mainly because the Black Sea, like the Baltic, is such an enclosed space. Jacob, sick bay. Um, most of the, the that particular sh cru ship I was talking about, the cruise I was talking about, which had the Commodore aboard taking over, didn't have a sick bay per se. Most of the people were in the converted wardroom. Paul Amos, did the Admiralty or Churchill consider sending two R class battleships from Prince Wales Range, or was that deemed too defensive approach? It was put forward as an option, but Churchill didn't like it. Because mainly the Admiralty didn't like the idea of sending two ships to Singapore on their own. Because they knew they'd be out there on their own. They wanted to send a carrier group. They wanted to send, basically, Force H was planning what they were planning on sending. And reinforcing Fort Chase. The idea was you take Force H, you reinforce it with an extra carrier and two extra capital ships. And you send out there. Well, the trouble is Ark Royals sunk. Or rather, I would always put Ark Royal as being lost, because the thing is, she's sunk by bad damage control as much as she is by enemy action. Um, I know Jamie Seedell likes to talk about, or does talk about quite often, the amount of um, issues she had built up by her war service, the amount of strain she'd had on her hull, etc. And I, I, I agree and concede that, but I still think if you'd had proper damage control and they'd done the things timely, as they were supposed to in the manual, she probably would have survived. It, I realise it's a judgement call, and I'm making a judgement in hindsight, but I feel fair in this occasion in making that judgement, because they didn't follow the instruction manual for dealing with an aircraft carrier. Tell us, real twenty-four knot horse R class horse. How many horsepower had they been? Had they in mixed oil, coal, pure oil, and whatever pure oil? Um, well, honestly, if you think about it,
So. The difference between the Queen Elizabeth class and the R class, the Revenge class, is not that great. Honestly, the R class are about 30,060 tons in normal. The Queen Elizabeth class, 33,000 tons in normal. The Queen Elizabeth class have 75,000 shaft horsepower, thanks to 24 water tube boilers, etc. And they get four, 24 knots. The R class have 18 Babcock and Wilcox mainly boilers with 40,000 shaft horsepower. So you have 18 providing 40,000, roughly 40, enough steam to generate 40,000 shaft horsepower, and 24 providing enough to generate 75. It's not, they're not the most efficient boilers that are put in the R class. So if you go over contemporary small tube boilers, and if we consider what is contemporary small tube boilers, for that we look at the courageous class. They have 18 small tube boilers, and they get 90,000 shaft horsepower. And the 18 small tube boilers that are put in them actually weigh less and take up less space than the 18 boilers stuck in the R class. Uh, the R class are, of course, built 1913 to 17, and the courageous class are built 1915 to 1917. But as said, my strong suspicion is the boilers put in them are at least ordered from 4H Massaging Corps. At least some of them are. And so if you ma if you put 18 small tube boilers in there, A, you'd save weight, and B, you'd have 90,000 shaft, probably near, enough steam to get 90,000 shaft horsepower, if you have the right steam turbine sets. In which case, you would definitely be doing 24 knots and possibly doing 28 knots. Mm, probably not, but you know. I could You could definitely be getting up to 26, uh, 26 knots with 90,000 shaft horsepower. So that's the thing. If you if the R class had gone for oil boil oil fuel boilers to, from the get go, uh, oil fuel small tube boilers from the get go, and just stuck in eighteen, you would be looking at something which was producing more than twice the shaft horsepower. When we go to HMS Hood, she gets 24 boilers, gives her gives her 144,000 shaft horsepower. So each boiler is just providing enough steam to roughly sustain 5,000 shaft horsepower. So, you know, there is increase going on there, efficiencies available. Frank Spiner, do you miss, uh, and also, how much would a 50 foot longer new bow have been? Why would you need a 50 foot longer new bow? Um, the Queen Elizabeth are 196.2 meters long. Uh, the Revenge is 189.2 meters long. So you are, they're about 23 foot 2 inches longer, the Queen Elizabeth class. Um, Renown class have 42 water tube boilers. This sort of thing can do 112,000 shaft horsepower. This shows you the differential between traditional boilers and steam bo and small tube boilers. Okay, the sheer difference in it, quantity. You know, got 42 of those boilers, they give you 112 shaft horsepower. Um, and they are... A hundred foot longer, pretty much, well, a hundred and four, a hundred and fifty foot longer than the Queen Elizabeth class. So, if you, well, I'm not sure why you've decided to go on for 50 foot extra and why you've added on the bow specifically. Um, so, yeah, you could have, you could have made them Queen Elizabeth class length without too much effort, effort in design. 
and you could have given them 18 small tube boilers and you would probably be looking at chips which would be 24, 26 knots. With contemporary technology at the time. And Rafa, is it accurate that Deutsche Schiff and uh, on the on the machine about uh, Brown started H class J, but only something like forty foot of steel went. Um, there are all sorts of discussions about that whether they did or didn't, and look, I'm fairly certain the yards after they finished building Turpitz and Bismarck did not sit there doing nothing. They started building something, but how far they actually got on with these things before they were turned over to mass submarine construction etc is up to an entire entire debate and his people trying to interpret all sorts of things take care Stafford Frank's well didn't have much room to type I thought so but I did it's a point I feel the need to make quite regularly because even in scenarios where they're not limited by typing space, people tend to just focus in on a battleship versus battleship. And admittedly, that did end up happening for me in UAD today, but it's very rare and it's unlikely. It's usually it's a task force versus a task force, which is a balanced formation. Um, yeah, but, you know, the, the, the whole broader battle line is what's going to be interesting, the battle formation. And I doubt it would be a line of battle. I think it'd be something far more free-frying, like Falklands or Coronel Sea. I don't. The the Austrians would probably keep it, try and keep it as a sword line. The British would probably be the ones who try and break it up because if they break it up, that's where they can use the speed and their maneuverability to their advantage. If the Austrians manage to re remain concentrated, that's the problem. Um. Uh, second question two: Out of the Russian Imperial, Imperial Russian dreadnoughts, what improvements could have been made to their design? None really within the criteria of building them in Russia. There are limits to what Russia can build at this time. My second, would the Russians have been better off building treaty-sized battleships instead of the Soyuz class? Um, ooh, probably, but there again... The major problem for the Russians was literally they just hadn't built anything for so long and they're jumping into a battleship. Uh, 96831, which 10 Soviet states do you think would have been used for the ship 6, for ship 6 to 15 of Soviet Soviet class? No idea. No idea. And there's a reason for that. I could say, I could spout off 10 names for you. But the thing is, they might not all get named, those names. They might get named Stalin. They might get named after other leaders of the revolution. They might get named after glorious battles. They might get named after, well, there's Red October. You know, there's all sorts of things. Theoretically, they do get named after states. Realistically, who knows what they're going to get named after. It's going to depend what the various commissars and comrades Stalin himself feel like. And remember, did, how did the German battleship British Naval Agreement of 1955 class the Panzer Did they count towards battleship tonnage? No. Um, I think they're put in the cruiser tonnage from memory. I think they're put in the cruiser tonnage. Yeah. I'm fairly certain they're put in the cruiser tonnage. How much of the building process in a ship in an enclosed shipyard can be automated with today's current technology? If you went full out, and I mean full out, and develop systems kind of like you have for HMS Queen, the Queen Elizabeth class carriers. Um, ammunition, maneuver, movement system, etc., and all those things. You could probably automate quite a large part of a ship construction process. I'm not sure how much of the wiring and electrics and plumbing you could automate. 
but there are certainly a lot of things, a lot of the steel, a lot of the hull construction, a lot of the, um, a lot of the components, the big physical components could be, and uh, modules could be, definitely be automated, the maneuvering of, and placing and bonding of them. And a how did the German Brit uh, answer that one? Um, Nice to refer Were the. Uh, question 5. Were the Russians trying to go from Gangets to Svetsky Soyuz without the steps in between? Well, yes, but there again, they hadn't, actually hadn't built the steps in between. They don't have. The, you don't, can't, can't go. Hang on, we need to build a whole load of ships so we can do the steps in between. No. You um, try and learn your best and try and muck your way through it. What do you think the Iran Navy will name the Type 83 destroyers if they're built, and what do you want them to name them? I'm not sure what they'll name them. I think there's a good chart. Oh, we've got the town class, and we've got the Duke class are gone, or the Type 23 Dukes are gone. But they might go back for the Dukes. They might go the Dukes sort of counties again. Because if you look at the Royal Navy, they do like to have things named for places in the UK. It makes people happy. It makes it more difficult for governments to cut. And yeah, there was Nelrodsky. Nelrodsky is what I'm probably going to go with. Because if the Russians are building something and are starting as straight away as soon as they can on the Naval Treaty, and they join the London Naval Treaty, then they have really got to... going as soon as they can and Nelrodsky is something which is available and ready to go and it's actually kind of simple, uh, easier for their infrastructure to build it could go counties They've gone, if the Royal Navy could build cruisers to the same tonnage as the Grass Bay, what would they look like? I guns and armor. They did build that. Okay. So. The Grass Bay is 14,000, well, 16,000 tons fully loaded. Um... Um, the county class are roughly 14,000 tons fully loaded. So you have about 2,000 more tons to play with. If the British are completely are free to do it, you probably find something with 9 to 12, 9.2 inch guns. And in which case the grass base on them becomes irrelevant. Because 6, 11 inch guns versus 12, 9.2 inch guns is not a fair fight. Um, nice turn. Out of the uh, free class of Russian dreadnought battleship, which is the best? Gangots. There is a reason they're captains are as long as they are. Steve Richards, if an Aegis sail ship goes in for a big repair, do they have their cannons upgraded? Um, well, they might not have them upgraded, but they might find themselves getting new ones. They might find themselves getting a different cannon mix. They'll probably find come out from if they've gone in for a major refit or a major re or a um, rebuild. They will probably come out with a very different gun uh, gun mix than they went in with, and those cannon might be cannon original to them. They might be new cannon.
I think they're how much bigger shell would a 9.2 inch arm counter glass have? Well, if you consider the 9.2 inch gun, um, if we go with the Mark 11, which is the 50 cal, which is what was fitted to Agamemnon, so it's sort of a good basis for it. They fired. Uh, they f uh, they fired a 380 pound shell. The um, Mark 8 8 inch gun fired a 256 pound shell, or rather 116 to 172.4 kilograms. Um, excuse me, I'm going to about to sneeze. <coughs> so, you're talking about something which is. Oof. Hundred sixteen to one hundred seventy-two. If my maths isn't mistaken, me, that's sixty-six kilograms difference, and the sixty-six kilograms difference means it's it's over fifty percent. Great, it's um, um, fifty percent bigger. Yeah, because that's one hundred twenty-four pounds differential. Because one's 380, one's 156 pounds. So, 124 pounds differential. Yeah, that, that's that's roughly 50% bigger shell from a 9.2 inch gun than it is fired from an 8 inch gun. I don't remember, what three of you nail yards to, to you refer to you in your Sharnal Spam Navy video uh, as having the ability to build them? Ah, well, Sharnal's one. Now, please note Deutschwerk, Kriegsmarine, Marineworth of Wilhelmshaven. And. A Blom and Voss are the three I'm going with because they are ready and their infrastructure is set up to build them. There are more yards than that. There's about another two yards which could theoretically build them. But the thing is they don't have the infrastructure in place at that time in 1935 to do so. Whereas Blom and Voss, uh, Kriegsmuniewerft and Deutschwerk do. And that's... Um, Deutschwerk in Kiel and Kriegsmuniewerf in Wilhelmshaven. <laughs> Cartoon Man 154. Was there an incident where Churchill sent a battleship to point its guns at a coastal town because there were concerns of being communist? Or did I imagine that? I remember seeing it on TV, I think. I don't think that ever happened. There are. There was um, interesting. There was there was a strike going on in a mining town on the coast, and a British battleship pulled in to fix something, and everyone was going ooh at one point. But it was just it literally getting fixed, and its guns were never pointed at anyone. Um, and there's always history of that. But that's that's one of the problems you have when you have a lot of battleships wandering around, and they take part in exercises, and they pull into a harbour because they've got something wrong in their engines and need to fix it. And then people go, oh, this is because the government wants to do this. And actually, it's nothing to do with that. The government, whatever, the government might not have even been told the Navy was pulling its ship into that harbour. Because why do they need to know? What's the point of filling up their work rate by telling them? Also, it probably wouldn't have been the captain's decision. So he wouldn't have actually asked permission. He'd have told people he was going to do it. Uh, Black Black Maximus, if HMS Hood went into refit in the 30s and the British had 600 PSI high pressure boilers and steam engines, what kind of speed could she get up to? Well, it depends what they want to do. If they've got that, if. Now, this is the big thing. 
If they've got 600 PSI boilers, what are the thing, the thing, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, do you want to go faster, i.e. do you want to replace all 24 boilers, or do you want to reduce your number of boilers? Because... The Yarra boilers which are being hit are quite high pressure. They are quite capable. So whilst they're not 600 PSI, they are efficient for their time. So, you know, that, the, the thing is, you could possibly, with 600 PSI, you could possibly take that down to roughly 18 boilers. So do you want to use that six, those six boilers for more speed, uh, for more sp uh, that six boiler salvage for more speed, more armor? What do you want to do? It's not a simple question of how fast can it, if they replace them all, with those boilers, then they could be talking about upping the shaft horsepower by... Possibly as much as another 36,000 shaft horsepower. And if you up it by 36,000 shaft horsepower, you've got to 180,000 shaft horsepower. And you can go very, very fast. You're probably talking... Probably that's an extra three, uh, three, four knots. But again, you're going to be saving weight, so you might might want to use that weight for other things. And I would argue, my main argument against the triple turrets on Argincor is that if they'd already gone for triple turrets on Argincor, then I'd expect the next designs built from scratch to have triple turrets, i.e. Hood, the Admiral class. Because it would have been a very easy way to make an Admiral class battlecruiser, a battlecruiser that has the same firepower as the Queen Elizabeth class, but it can and that can actually have slightly better protection, but has the speed, is by just lopping off a turret and the space a turret takes up in a hull, and still having nine guns. Because let's be honest, Hood is thirty one point eight meters at the beam. The Queen Elizabeth class are 27.6 meters at B. So she already has 4.2 meters wider than the B and than the Queen Elizabeth class. So she could have accommodated a triple turret within uh, on her system, especially if she's only carrying three of them. And it would save on crew to an extent. It, yeah, four triple turrets. Three triple turrets would save on crew, yes, versus for, uh, four d twin turrets. It would save on crew. It would save on hull space. All sorts of things. So you, if you had triple turrets available, the Queen Elizabeth, the Admiral class would have had them. If you've been do it, designing them. I said, would nine. F I'm presuming it's 7.4 to 8.8, 8, rather than 74 to 8 to 8,000 uh, ton, type 26, and uh, it have required to British to invest in shipyards. Yeah, it would have required some investment in our shipyards for those, but honestly, if you've been building larger ships prior to it, you probably don't have to. The shipyards reflect what you've built in them recently. Well, in the nicest way, can her hull handle that extra speed? You're probably going to want to reinforce the bow a bit. Can you do it? Probably. She's still quite a new ship at this point. And remember, she's only coming to service in nineteen thirty in nineteen twenties. If you do it in the early nineteen thirties, which is what you've put, you could do it.
Bonus. Had Ark Raw been kept afloat, gotten to Gibraltar, how long would have been before she'd be able to go to US and then how long to repair and what changes would have happened? Probably not many changes. Um, she'd have probably been patched up and heading to America within a month. And then you're probably looking about six months to do the full the sets of repairs. That they would want to do them. Do to her. To get her up to basically back, uh, give her all the refits and full peacetime repairs that they wanted to do, they needed to do her. Do to her. Um, Senator Canary, you're an industrializing South American nation in the 1900s. How would you go about building up industry to build serious ship battleships? I've got to get my steel industry going. From my steel and metallurgi metal me uh, metallurgical industry comes my weapons, comes my ship construction, comes everything. So steel industry first, and then I work out the rest. Infrastructure. I've got to work out what I'm fuel I'm going to use to supply those ships. I've got to get education working so I can have the, have the labor force with the skills I need. Not just the people who are going to be apprenticed at the lower levels doing the actual construction, but the people who are going to be design work and development work and all the research science work. So you need you need the universities going. Um, basically, I've got to revamp the whole economy and get it working. I can do that, because let's be honest, I do it in Argentina and Brazil a few times in Railroad Tycoon. If, if the British were building two to three thousand ton destroyers, does the size like this suit the IG and the USN more than British? Um, not. The Americans wouldn't mind it, but the Americans aren't going to be getting any construction done anytime soon. Uh, by the time the Americans, it's going to be, it's going to, the, the, the size thing doesn't affect, it doesn't matter to the Congress. They, they to Congress, they don't care. They, they will only start caring about those things and freeing up money for construction once they think war is imminent and they're actually going to have to use them. So, basically, the Americans will enjoy it and be able to play around with it more, but they're still going to stretch it out. So the Japanese will probably still try to cram more in, and the British will just build what they're building, but bigger. So, frankly, it probably helps the British more than the rest, on average. Because by the time the Americans are building serious numbers of destroyers anyway, they've stopped to, they, they're completely ignoring the treaties. Um, Black Masters, what could the UK do if the military spending without pensions percentage of GDP is on par with the US? Um, if we're not including pensions and war graves and those things in, in defence spending, and we are doing the defence spending, we are probably looking at... Well, that's pretty much double what we currently provide. And it's more than double once you include the stuff, don't include the stuff, we take it off. It's so, you are probably looking at an easy growth in the armed forces of perhaps 100%, possibly more. The reason I say more is you can uh, you can pay people a lot more. Uh, but also, if you consider what's the infrastructure required to maintain keep two carriers in service versus the infrastructure to keep four carriers in service. Well, we might need another dry dock, but we're planning on building one of those anyway. And that's it. So honestly, it becomes more and more. The more you have, the more cost efficient it gets because you already have to pay a certain level of premium to procure stuff at its base level and have the stuff to sustain it. So you have when you have more above that, you actually it actually comes in more efficiently, more cheaper. So you could grow the armed forces quite a chunk, quite a chunk on that level. Um. Honest, have you seen the recent press demo by Sheffield Forge Masters on their electron beam molding robots? I think so. Yeah, and yeah, it's an interesting thing. It's all there's all sorts of stuff for Sheffield Forge Masters, which is interesting if you look into them. Let's take everyone. Question ten: Would I be right to say that the British were in a better position to jump from low to high thousand plus tons uh, to two thousand three hundred ton top range for destroyers than the Germans were? Yes, because the British had actually been building bigger destroyers. For example, do you ever consider yourself to be a science channel? No. Because I'm a historian. 
I teach history of engineering and I've taught history of science. So I have those and I and occasionally I have some certain areas of scientific knowledge because as said I did study astrophysics um, quite extensively when I whenever I've been given an opportunity it's one of those things I go and study. It's kind of like um let's put it this way, I'm an naval historian. And I love naval history. But if I wasn't a naval historian, I would be a Roman history a history buff, probably. And if I wasn't a Roman historian, I would probably be an IT technician, IT, uh, IT engineer, um, doing software coding and probably computer game development, because that's always interested me. And if I wasn't that, I'd be an astrophysicist. Those are my career interests. And if I wasn't that, I'd be a carpenter. Because I like working with wood. And one of my dearest joys about the house we could be moving to is it has a woodworking shop. One of my probabilities about it is that I will not get to turn it into it, keep it as a woodworking shop because it will get turned into a storage space. But I am hoping very much to keep it as a woodworking shop and turn it into a model railway and woodworking shop. Mm hmm. I know those two don't always go together, but it look, it's, it's the only way I can get to keep the space, okay? So it's what I, whatever I do to keep the space. And then, what I will slowly do, as time presents it, I will slowly, I will slowly replace the IKEA furniture in my ha in my uh, my annex with stuff I build make myself. Slowly over time, you'll know it'll be over a course of years. It'll be as I get time and as I enjoy it, but it will slowly be replaced. At this point, I'm half convinced that the carpenter is your day job. You just don't get paid for it. It's certainly my major job in the family. <laughs> Considering what I'm doing to floorboards recently, yes. And I know the I know the technician is going to come back to me and go, "You were supposed to take the floorboards up." And no, they are bonded into the wall. If I take them up, I'm physically going to damage the wall. I'm not rebuilding the entire wall for you to get access to them. So I have cut a large hole in it. How do you know it's a large enough hole? Well, you see. What I did was I used an A4 sheet, an a, a box which is exactly the same size as an A4 sheet of paper. Stuck that in the middle, drew a line, uh, drew a square around it, took that out, used a hand drill to drill holes at regular intervals through that those lines I created, so I could check beneath them using a hand drill. Remember, hand drill, so I wouldn't go through any electric wires and then shine a light around to check there was no electric wires on it. And then I am going to use my jigsaw to go zoom, 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 zoom. Cut it out, and then the plan is once you fi once they fixed uh, the electricians on their job, I then come in, put in piece of wood here, piece of wood here. That ni and nicely grip in two sides, and I'll put in. Then I put the, the thing I cut out or back on top of it, and voila, done. Holds it up. And then you put over new carpet and underlay over it, and woohoo, no one notices it knows what's underneath it. And I've got uh, just have a note of electrics access, uh, right on top of it, electrics access. Pa uh, Access. Electrical systems access point. Access point. Poems. Are war graves part of the fence spending? Yes. Model railway building channel. Mm, that could be fun. I might start, I might, if I get the shop set up properly, and I can get some cameras put into it, and sort of so I can get some fixed point cameras so I don't have to worry about cameras being in the way. I will set up and I will do sort of things of like painting, uh, painting trains and painting, um, I might set up a channel, a separate channel which does, has me painting space marines and painting model trains, and because there was one of those things, I can't draw for a toffee, honestly, I really can't. And um, I was trying to do the um, the things for the the video about what would uh, the Imperial Star Destroyers look like if they're designed by the various 1920s and 30s navies. 
what would they look like? Video, and I was trying to do it in CAD, and I couldn't get it. They just, they just didn't look right for me. Me drawing CAD, they just, they just look like bad drawings. Um, and I can do CAD quite well. I can do a modern warship in CAD if I want to, but I couldn't get them to look right. And the trouble is, they come out. And I realize when I'm doing the modern warship, I'm looking for a plan, not looking for an image. And there's a difference. It doesn't come out quite right. So we'll see. Let's see. Night Terran, could the third Lord Nelson class semi dreadnought battleship have been finished even with all HMS dreadnoughts being built? Yes. But you have to remember the Lord Nelsons are actually built unfinished after dreadnoughts being built. Dreadnought into service before Lord Nelson and Agamemnon does. Do. Uh, Night Terran, what are the odds that the Royal Navy's 40 cannon class run would have be used the names that went to the York class? Very high. Very high. Um, because, let me put it this way. Uh, the Royal Navy doesn't have a history of having an HMS Yorkshire. There has been one, but it was a merchant ship. Which was taken up for war, war, war service. Usually it's York. And so there have been 10 ships for York. And if we go for... Also if you try and look for HMS Devon. It's Devonshire. That is a county class, so that would probably mean Exeter might not get used, but she might get used. Um, there are... There are quite a few counties that the UK can, they can call from. There are 33 in Scotland... There are 13, theoretically, in Wales, uh, in terms of historic counties. Uh, there are 20, uh, there are, how do I put this? Um, there are, an it's, the modern Wales is about divided into 22 areas. Um, so that would be different. There's, of course, there's Northern Ireland as well, which is the six counties. So you, and you have 48 in the UK, uh, 48 ceremonial counties, 84 actual ones, um, and there's all historic ones. So you have plenty, you can, do, there are plenty for the Royal Navy to choose from. Is what I'm trying to say. You know, you go for your maximum, you've got 81 plus, let's be honest, it's speed 13, so it's going to be 94, 100 counties. They could, they could have named 100 counties and not bothered. Nice turn. Uh, how quickly does the Furtaka class become outdated and inadequate in a world where 9.2 inch arm can use class are running around? Um, not necessarily outdated and adequate, but the thing is, they're going to be different roles. Uh, you know, the Furtaka class are fine ships, but 
if you consider when they are built, they are heavy cruisers, they are armed with 7.9 inch guns. If... Which is, you know, yes, the next generations are armed with 8 inch guns, and they are upgrading themselves to eight in uh, three twin 8 inch guns. Um... The thing is, they would have probably been upgraded to three twin 9.2 inch guns. It would have been a tough fit, but they would have, that's what the Japanese would have tried for. And they're going to be light heavy cruisers wandering around, and that's it. You know, th this is... <sighs> the point I often make is if the British are running around in treaty scenario, and the British have got 9.2 inch guns on their cruisers, then everyone else is going to have 9.2 inch guns on their cruisers. That's the simple mathematics of it. If you've got a system where somehow the British are managing to get 12 9.2 inch guns on their heavy cruisers and everyone else is limited to 8 inch guns and 8 of them then the British have got A got a massively unfair advantage because not only firing, firing shells which are going to be 50% heavier they're going to be firing 4 of them so 4 more of them so if you think about that they've got Eight, uh, they've got. They're firing about twice the weight of broadside. Same rate of fire, twice the weight. They're firing twelve shells, which each weigh fifty percent more. So actually, no, they're firing the equivalent of eighteen. You can argue eighteen. They're firing, they're, they're firing the equivalent of 18 8 inch shells at you, and you're firing 8 back. That's more than twice your fire, uh, twice your, uh, uh, you know, your weight of broadside. Uh, that That's not a good scenario to be in for anyone. And that immediately makes everyone out then, uh, everyone, in trouble. What changes the Japanese and American cruiser design if the heavy cruisers had 10 inch guns? They better be larger ships. Um, probably not much. Honestly, not much. They probably still go to the same policies because the guns don't matter. The size of guns don't matter ultimately to their design. What matters is their philosophy on their ship. Because let's be honest, the British could have gone for something which is a far um, less capable vessel, but it carries more guns quite easily for the British needs. The British needed an all-purpose, all all-rounder ship, and that's what they get with their candy class. The Americans want to start off with a reconnaissance vessel and then a fighting vessel, and they are orientated around that, not peacetime duties. The Japanese are looking from the get-go for something which is going to try and punch above its weight. So that's what defines their design policies, not the rest. Oh, Jacob. Um, just as noticing you in the chat and remembering what I said, I have passed on your message and we're going to sort... These things are going to get sorted out. It is becoming a bit... It needs to be dealt with. Okay. It does need to be dealt with. I do say it. I do agree. And we've all been a bit swamped. And it's easy to forget these things, but it can't be forgotten. Let's be honest, the, um, the guns are interesting. Question 14, what changes in... Answer that one, question 15. Would a 3,000 to 3,500 ton Fletcher class destroyer and two far larger, three, nearly 3,000 ton Farragut class destroyers have fared better in Typhoon Cobra? Um, large, larger ship is the, usually the better it does. Okay, it, how much better they'd have, they'd have fared would depend on how well uh, what they've been designed around and various other things around them. But the odds are larger ships would fare better. You don't want to sail into these things, and it's no guarantee. But usually, larger does have slightly more survivability in these scenarios. 
Like, Aaron, would the Boston class guiding missile cruisers be better at 18 to 22,000 tons? The Amma class guiding missile cruisers would be better at 19 to 23,000 tons. Depends what they do with the weight. If they do the, 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 the displacement, if they use it like they could use it, then they would be better. If they don't, it won't. whole discussion going on about war graves in the chat and I'm just sort of watching go through and going hmm um Kelvin replacing the furniture chief of Brian's like, once you have finished to finish to replace the IQ is self-made you can replace the first self-made ones repeat until done repeat until bored yeah I'm like Kevin there seems to be a recurring debate amongst US naval strategists a few large aircraft carriers versus a large number of small or less cable carriers do you have an opinion on this Okay, here. Uh, this is going to sound terrible, but if I want to build a modern aircraft carrier, and I'm going to get into this because I'm going to do a video about warship costs. I might even do it this week. Um, it's going to depend on what time I get and how much work I have to spend rebuilding things after the electrician's left. Um, and I know I've got to rebuild at least two doors as well after he goes anyway. Um, so, there are certain things which are, broadly speaking, fixed costs. You're going to be spending on engines. Believe it or not, the idea that you need, you're, you need much more, vastly more powerful engines the larger your ship is, not necessarily the case. Uh, because of length to beam ratio, etc., and you're wanting a certain beam and certain length, these things, it, it can actually be roughly the same. It's not going to be a massive cost differential once you're talking about the cost of the ship. Then you've got all the systems you need to put on the ship to operate as a carrier. Do you want it as a catabar carrier, in which case you need to fit all those accoutrements, all the, you know, the catapult systems, the arrestor systems, all those things. Uh, you've got to have lifts. How many lifts are you going to have? Well, are you going to have two or are you going to have three? How many lifts? Again, there are fours and against. A larger carrier will tend to have more lifts, which allow more opportunity for rapidly moving aircraft from below to above, but also going to have a larger air group to launch, etc. and recover. Then it's going to be a question of asking what do you need to do that carrier with. Do you need to just do sea control, in which case you're going to sit far out at sea and do nothing but control the ocean around you? Well, then you need only a certain amount of aircraft, a certain amount of facilities. If you need to get into strike range and you want to do stri deliver strike packages on targets and you're going to go close to the threat, you're going to want to have more aircraft. So, broadly speaking... For what America wants to do with its carriers, unless it radically changes what it actually wants to do with its carriers, I would say they're going in the right direction for getting the most cost-efficient availability. But, and I do say this, there is a reason they keep flirting with it. If I get the sea control ship, if I find a picture of it, ah yes, the sea control ship. Occasionally, let's see. So, I'm just going to put it up. Hopefully it works. There you go. So, the sea control ship. That's one of the designs looked at. There were other options as well. There are lots of options considered. 
And the basic thing you have to realize of all this is that it's a fine vessel if you want to do a limited mission. It's a fine vessel if you want to do a limited mission. But that was the trouble the US Navy came up with, because they kept wanting to do more and more of them. And this is why you get people looking, going... <sighs> because they basically saw, looked at them and saw them, okay, well, they can be a modern version like the escort carrier. We can keep re-rolling them for this and this and this and this and this. And the more missions you want to do with them, the more you have to add in stuff to them. Okay, so you want to do strike missions. You're going to need to carry that those the weaponry you need for strike missions. The ammunition, those, this, you know, the different weapons. You're going to need to carry that in the magazines. You want to do anti-ship missions. Oh, great. You're going to need to carry that weaponry in your magazines. You're going to need to operate in that standard. You're going to be able to integrate with these kinds of task groups. Uh, do you want it still operate as a command ship? Well, there's a reason it's called the sea control ship. It was also supposed to be in the command ship. So you're going to need all the facilities for the Admiral staff, etc. And that is the basic problem for the Americans. Whilst your carrier is your hub, and is expected to do all these range of missions, they can't be expected to do anything else. And people then point out and go, well, what about the marine ships, the LHDs? Well, they're good. They're lovely ships. Why can they get away with being smaller? Well, A, they are supposed to do different missions. They've got a different mission set. But also, B, because they've got such a, a focused mission set, they can get away with being focused on it. And yes, some of the America class are being used as baby carriers occasionally. And this has brought this back as an option of, oh, we can use these ships as they go. And you then ask them, uh, so what do you want to, do you want to do this mission with this baby carrier? No. Do you want to do this mission with this baby carrier? No. Nope. Why? Because it's not stress, it's not designed for it. It's not designed for that operation. It's not designed for that operation. If you wanted to make the sea control, one of the first interesting things that came up with is the sea control ship. The Americans, when they were looking in the 1970s, and again, when they were looking them in the late, in the mid 1980s, they worked out very quickly they would need to basically buy not just upgraded Harriers, sea Harriers, not just attack, not ground attack Harriers, but sea Harriers, as in the air defense versions from the British, but, and there's some of the ideas for it, but they would have to buy Sea King, ASC 7s, uh, the airborne early warning helicopters, because if you're going to make it a Vistal carrier, then trying to operate Hawkeye off it and it, with its size was going to be prohibitive. And they looked at various other options as well. So basically, the problem you come up with with the size of carriers is what do you want to do with it? What aircraft do you want? What, do you, what missions do you want to do? With it? What aircraft do you want to operate from it to do those missions? And therefore, that drives the size of your carrier. The reason the carriers have got bigger is because aircraft have got bigger. So again, well, sometimes I'm going, well, we used to be able to operate with 5,000 ton aircraft carriers. And I go, yeah, but our aircraft used to be measured in single digit tonnage. We consider the most famous aircraft to operate off those strike, those particular strike carriers, or rather most famous for doing it. And we are, of course, talking about the fairy swordfish. Well... That, that lovely aircraft, a fairly swordfish, has an all-up weight, and this is the important thing, a thing, an all-up weight of 7,580 pounds, or 3,438 kilograms. That's three and a half, less than three and a half tons. An F-35... Another beautiful aircraft. Remember, an aircraft which can take off vertically. F-35B takes off vertically. Does all these amazing things. Has a full takeoff weight of 27.2 tons if it's in maximum if it's in maximum load. Its empty weight alone is 14.7 tons. Its fuel load can be 6 tons. Its weapons payload can be another 6.8 tons. So think about that. For the aircraft carrier, the aircraft that they operated was, an, well, 3.5 to 27, 
27 divided by three and a half. We've, we've got very close to it's an eighth. And considering it's just under, that's just over. Probably an eighth. So, for your, if you want to operate an escort carrier, your equivalent escort carrier these days, you're probably looking at is about 40,000 tons. About one. Well, yeah. To operate those aircraft. Because once you've got all of weights, all those things, and all the uh, ordnance and all the other stuff you need to have in, because that's, again, far heavier, far more complicated to take up. You Once you factor all those things into your carrier design to do an equivalent carrier to an escort carrier, you're probably talking about a 40,000 ton vessel. So this is another problem for some of the people when they're making these points about smaller carriers. They don't know. They, they honestly don't do, go on and do the basic fact checking. They're just looking at all things going, well, we used to have carriers of this size. Yes, you did. But if you think about it in the case of, I don't know, the American fleet carriers, the Yorktowns and their Nimitz, and you look at the size of aircraft they're operating versus the size of their the size of the carrier, and then you look at the size of the aircraft today and the size of the carrier. Carriers in many ways haven't gone up as much as the aircraft they're carrying have. Damon's new concept for Portugal looks like an LHD, Cartoon Man 1.4. Not a carrier, it looks like an LHD. My turn. Would it be accurate to think that the uh, two ten year and five Kuma class cruisers were planned for post World War One? I would certainly say they were on that schematic. They're on that sort of idea train. They didn't get there, but they were on that idea train. Um, Magnus, what if the Fisher a Fisher is the first sea lord until nineteen fourteen, but then dies in office until I home? What is the impact on the Royal Navy and the ships that are built? Um, oh, well, there might be more battle cruisers built, but he's still going to deal with the politicians pushing for battleships, battleships, battleships. So, odds are he might actually get more ships actually built. Because he's probably getting at least five, he, he's probably arguing for at least, because he always wanted them built in at least six. So he might be getting eight order the year anyway. Because the man is just that scary. Uh, I would also argue that he would have pushed the guns a bit faster. I don't know if he stops at 13 and a half inch. I think he might have pushed for the 14 inch. Because there were 14 inch guns at civil levels than the 15 inch was. When they went for it. And I think he might have pushed for the 14 inch versus the 13 and a half inch. And that could have been an interesting scenario. Could have been a very interesting scenario. It's like when people say, "Well, you send an uh, you send a aircraft carrier to show your presence." No. By the time an aircraft carrier shows up. You have tr you have shown your presence several times with a lot smaller things. You sending an aircraft carrier is you sending the major task group to go. Excuse me. Okay, we've been polite the last few times. We're making it blatantly obvious. You do this, there is going to be a lot of problems falling on you from a great height. Stop it. Trouble is, you need to back that up. That's your main problem. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I just had a comment shot for some reason on my screen. I, I'm still not quite sure why the YouTube comment did, but it's from uh, someone called Plague Doctor. 
who has just said with the, has bought uh, bought a six pack of Iron Brew and now understands why I drink it out of a beer mug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are reasons for this. It's good, but it also does do well out of a beer, beer mug, especially a glass one. Keeps me honest as well. Um. Yeah, with Fisher, I think the big thing you'd have differential is I. I think he'd be talking fourteen sixty. I think he'd be talking two inch jumps. Because he wasn't in favour of just of doing the moderating jump. He remember. He was always about always about making the big splash to get peace. His idea was he could get peace by technological superiority. That was his obsession. He could get peace by technological superiority. So, A, he would have pushed for small troll boilers the moment they came available, oil firing. He, a moment, there would have never been any chance of the R class being even considered to being coal fired if he is the first sea lord till 1914. There is never any chance of these things not jumping up in the gun. So, I think with Fisher, if he stays in post till 1914. If he stays in post till 1914, let's see. That would give him an extra three years. So he'd see 1912, 1913, and then 1914. Um, if he sort of dies when he originally takes over in 1914, it's it's going to be different. But also, there's the fact of would World War One have been like it ha like it was? Would there have been any? If Fisher advising the cabinet is A, not going to keep as quiet as other admirals do because he's a far stronger personality, and B, he is going to have the fleet formed up and exercising off the German coast the moment this is becoming a height. It's going to be painfully obvious to Geyser Wilhelm that the Royal Navy is ready for war and is waiting outside his door. There's going to be none of the demurring. So the question is, does World War I happen in 1914? If it doesn't happen in 1914, if Anglo-Russian relations are continuing to deteriorate and the Germans stop building, and let's be honest, they, have, they are pretty much stopping building by this point, despite the German Navy's, the, the uh, Kaiserlich Marine plan, uh, the plans, they're just not going to get it done because, frankly, the army wants the money. If they stop building, then the British have British pretty much won. At a certain point, the British and the, the Entente might well break down. And remember, it's always an understanding, never an alliance. It's an understanding, not an alliance. And there is a difference between that. It might be subtext, but there is a difference. And if the Russians go off the reservation, as far as the British are concerned, anymore, the French have had to do panic, absolutely panicked diplomacy about four times in 1912, 1913, to try and keep the British and the Russians together. The Russians go any further off the reservation, the British are leaving the Entente. World War One is inevitable, I would agree. World War One in its form is not is not inevitable. Go in. You've somehow found your way to nineteen ten Germany and managed to convince the Kaiser to let you design next class of battleships. What do you design given existing infrastructure take a day? Could you stick that in this in the question uh, in the questions chat, um, go in? Because then I'll get to it. Because it's an interesting question. But if you can, you stick it in in here so it sort of appears in this way. Just click on the blue thing at the top of the chat and stick it in there, and it should come up. Um. Okay. Now, what if you say the tonnage of all other ships of the Washington Treaty is 14,000 tons and under? 
What would Ryujo look like? And would any other nations attempt to build carriers at that time before London? Oh yeah, the British would build them. The British would continue Hermes. Uh, if they've got no limit, the British keep building Hermes. I improved Hermes. Because Hermes is only 11,000 tons. Um... Yeah. Um, the British would keep... Hermes comes in at 11,000 tons in standard. If the British are able to build them an extra 3,000 tons, then they get a larger class of Hermes, and they probably keep, they probably build a couple of them. They will probably be building one or so a year along their cruisers, because Hermes is basically the cruiser carrier for the Royal Navy. That's what they're looking at. And if you've got an extra 3,000 tons... You are probably talking about getting them up to 28 knots in speed. And you're probably talking about getting the aircraft carried up to a solid 36. Probably. Okay, because of where the tonnage will go. And also how much more efficient you can make it. Because as she is, she comes up armed with six single 5.5 inch guns and... Three single four inch guns, so probably she'd end up with a combined armament, a dual purpose armament, um, all sorts of things. And you know, you you'd have those vessels coming into service quite regularly from 1924 onwards. So it would be commissioned nine. It's commissioned 1924 as as she is. If she'd been, you know, if they keep they kept on building them, you'd probably had one come in service 1924, another one come into service 1926, another one come in service 1928. No one coming to service 1930, so you'd have three or four of them in service. The Americans would have followed suit, and the Japanese would have. And if Ryojo had been able to have an extra 4,000 tons, who knows, she might not have been as unstable. They can't really do much more, but they could actually make the hull slightly better, and that would make a fix the stability issues. Master, yeah, legit. Um, is that's the drama series, isn't it? Carry on. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see. There's. There's some interesting stuff going on with it. Um, I honestly haven't watched it, but what I've heard about it, and I'm actually, I've actually gone into an email to a, from a friend of mine who has watched them all. Yeah, she seems to think it's it's uh, as well done as America. Uh, the the phrase I'll quote, and this is coming from I will, and a Canadian. It's coming from a Canadian, not a French Canadian either. A Canadian who has studied in Britain and studied in, and now teaches in America. According to her, it's about as well done as a historical, well done from a historical accuracy perspective as you ever can expect from America, from American production company. Don't worry, Governor. I just like the questions appearing here because then the people watching later can definitely see which questions I'm referring to. And it also stops the whole chat appearing up in the la in the here and me losing the questions. See Harriers like Harriers were yeah, well see Harriers were, but there was a um there was the P1154 design, which was supposed to be 1.5 to 1.8 Mac. And that was the Super Harrier, basically. Um, which was supposed to be successor. And again, if you have the Americans coming in with a sea control ship, and they want to make that better, the Super Harrier probably gets to sit off and the it becomes an Anglo-American project, and who knows where that goes. I don't know, why did the Washington Naval Treaty cause cruiser construction be scrapped as Sendai class? Well, first of all, you have to consider what the Sendai class were. 
They were building eight of them. They were being designed around the 5.5 inch gun. Lovely. They're being designed around all sorts of things. But the thing is, the moment you have the Washington Treaty come in, they are suddenly not up to snuff. Because, let's be honest, you build them because you need them, but they don't fit in the requirements and fits of the Washington Naval Treaty. In terms of the Washington Treaty, you're allowed something which is up to 10,000 tons. These are 5,000 tons. Well, they're not going to be the same as other cruisers. And if you keep building them, you don't have space in the yards to build the other bigger ships which you want to build. So you finish off the three you're building. You cancel the five you haven't started yet. And you start building something bigger. Which is pretty much what the Japanese do. Mainly going for eight inch gunships. How did Danger Mouse lose his eye? That's an interesting question and I cannot remember. Nine second were the Katori class crews a waste of resources. Were the Katori class a waste of resources. Um Let's see, what have I got notes on them? I have got notes on them. They're training cruisers. They're not a waste of resources, they're just a waste of time. Uh, look, they are minimally armed training cruisers. The Japanese are building them because they're trying to finally expand their fleet. They should have probably been built in 1930. They should have probably been purchased 10 years previously. And they should have probably been got in as some form of, uh, calling it some sort of auxiliary. Um, but they did what they did. They got them. It's a, it's not a waste of resources because they need the training ships. They need to be able to expand their training facilities. Their training is always lagging behind because what the Japanese do is they build the ships and then they start training the personnel for them. Whereas what other navies tend to do is they start recruiting personnel and then they build the ships for them. Hi, Debrock. Oh, good Lord. <clears throat> Which one's been in the news lately? How useful would a a roughly 8,000 ton light cruiser with 6 twin 3.9 inch dual purpose um, guns be to the Imperial Japanese? Not that useful at all to what they want to do and how they want to fight. Just not. Um, Cartoon Man, do you think Project Ark Royal will go anywhere? I presume you're meaning... Judging by the news, the one about adding um, enhanced drone launching systems to Queen Elizabeth class carriers. Probably will at some point. How quickly it goes that way and how much funding is expended on it is going to be an interesting question. But it probably will happen slowly over time. Gobbin, you somehow found your way to 1910 Germany and managed to convince the Kaiser to let you design next class battleship. What do you design? Giving existing infrastructure and tech of the day. 
1910. Um, let me consider what were the German dreadnoughts ordered in 1910. I don't want, it's not the ones I want built in 1910, it's what's being ordered in 1910. Uh, that would be uh, a coining class, really. So basically, I get to replace the coinage class. Oh. Potentially the Kaiser class. Well. Okay, I think I pushed for my fast battleship idea. I think I want to have four. I want to have a four propellers, four shafts of hull. I would want to have. They have sixteen for free, so they have roughly five each. I'd want twenty-four boilers. And if I add on eight boilers and I use Parsons turbines, which were used in some of them, I think it was Kaiser. Doesn't she have Parsons turbines? Yeah, she has Parsons turbines. So I've got sixteen coal. I've got coal-fired boilers, and she could get twenty-three point four knots with her boilers and her turbines. If I give them all Parsons turbines and I give them 24 bo uh, tube, water tube boilers. So I then have 50% more power. I have four screws to put that power through. Four, uh, four turbine sets, four, uh, uh, four screws. I can probably get them up to 26 knots at least, if not 28, and maybe even 28 knots. And, um, yeah, what else do I want to do? I would, I forgot the coining class. Yes, it's a coining class. So, I would be looking at getting them, uh, putting Parsons boilers, putting in, they have 12. Hmm, cute. Well, I'd still want to go 24, but that doubles my shaft horsepower to 61,000 shaft horsepower. 62,000 shaft horsepower for four uh, for four boilers. Um, that's pretty good, because that gives me um, 15,500 shaft horsepower per, uh, per turbine. Yeah, that should do. Um, so if I go, if I've got the Koenig class, or the Kaisers, Koenig's preferably better. A... I'm going to go with the same outline they're going with, which is the five turrets. But I'm going to try and bump up the speed. And the reason I'm going to bump up the speed is already they have two funnels. So they already have sp a nicest way. There is no reason they cannot do what I want to do. Um, I'd have to make it slightly fatter and slightly longer in terms of uh, slightly longer in terms of the hull and slightly larger secondary funnel. But that doesn't really bother me too much. If I do that, I can get them from 12 boilers to at least 24. That's what I'd be aiming for, because they've got 8 and 4. Don't they? That's what I said. So, well, if I have add on 4 and a 4 shaft, that does it for me, and I have 8 and 8. I can still probably get quite a big spe a speed bump and get them up higher. But ideally, I want to take those boilers and I want to get that ship to... 28 knot, 24, 28 knots, so, so 26 knots at least. The reason I want to do that is I want to make my most powerful battleship as fast as I can possibly make it while still keeping armor and everything else the same. Because if I can go for a fast battleship, and I can put a fast battleship in the water, and I can cancel the battle cruisers of that year, 
and put more effort into those battleships and build those battleships. So I don't have just four Koenigs, but I have maybe five or even six Koenigs. That's going to give me a tremendous tactical advantage over the Royal Navy, because it's going to mean the only ships that can catch me out of the Royal Navy's other battle cruisers. And they can't fight me. Which is going to make for the Royal Navy it even more imperative that the Queen Elizabeth class have to be 28 knot ships. So the thing is, I don't want to I don't want to use technology, which is expensive to me, to try and win this race. But if I can start changing things and dictating part of the qualitative race for the Royal Navy, I can cause them a lot of trouble. Guns take a lot of development time and um, cost a lot and also compete with the army. So politically, that's going to cause me trouble. Similar with developing better, higher quality armor. So, the only option I have that doesn't directly compute the army is if I go for boilers. And by Parsons. So, I want to give them speed. So, I take the 20 class and I take them up to 20, 26 at least knots. If I can get them to 28 knots, I'm even happier. If I get them to 28 knots, then I am king of the. Mm, Hill. Thank you all. The stall version of 35 was advertised potentially giving sea control and maybe assault type ships a credible strike ability. Have any navies anywhere considered this as an option? The Royal Navy is entirely built around it. That's the entire construction of Queen Elizabeth class. They're entirely built around it, the F-35B being a strike option. Um, there are lots of other navies, Italy, etc., which are basically are going for it as well. So all the navies which are built around Harriers are going to be built around F-35Bs from now on. So Japan's rebuilding their helicopter carriers to do it. Um, the Australians keep toying with the idea for the Canberra class, but they have realised they basically ripped everything out of the Canberra class when they're designing them. They could have done it, but you know they're going to keep considering it. There's all sorts of options there. So yeah, there they are. Right, so if the Washington Treaty is ten ten seven four four, and forty thousand for battleships, thirty thousand tons for carriers, and fourteen thousand tons for everything else, what can Navy is Germany going to try and build? They can't do anything. The Washington Treaty doesn't matter for the Germans in the nineteen twenties. What matters for them is the Treaty of Versailles. And honestly, that treaty matters until you get the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. Because until you get the Anglo-German Naval Treaty, there is always the massive risk that the British will react. So until you have the 1935 Anglo-German Naval Treaty, the, uh, the only treaty that matters as far as Germany is concerned is the Treaty of Versailles. And the fact is, if you do have that as your Washington Treaty, 40,000 tons of battleships, 30,000 tons for carriers, and 40,000 tons for everything else, on a 10 10 7 4, for ratio. The French Navy is going to be bigger. The Italian Navy is going to be bigger. The Japanese Navy is going to be bigger. But the Royal Navy and American Navy are going to be massive. Because that's going to work out as 20, 20, 14, and 4, and 4. Which are 8 and 8. Which means the British are going to be able to have 800,000 tons of battleship. Which, let's cons if you consider the, uh, if you consider that scenario... If you go to uh, consider the Washington uh, the, the Washington Naval Treaty, um, well, you now got. That's, that's going to be a lot. They, they, they have a lot of tonnage spare to build ships. Let me put it this way. They have a lot of tonnage spare to build ships. 
Um, if they have it for eight hundred thousand tons, and they're able, to, they could build. They you'd be talking the Royal Navy could build at least ten forty thousand. Well, hang on. Yeah, good day. Yeah. The Royal Navy could build 10 ships in the 1920s and not beat the treaty, go over the treaty limit. The Americans could also build quite a few German ships. So pretty much the problem comes for that is that Germany, once they do start building ships, are even further behind the curve. And at 40,000 tons, you're getting a very you're getting an F3 shaped Vessel with 16 inch guns. At the least. You are probably talking. How do I put this politely? Uh, you are. Probably talking something a lot, lot faster than a Nelson, a Nelson Rodney. Um, You're talking fast battleships the whole way, which causes problems again for the Germans because their infrastructure. So it's just the more I think about it, the more I go through the stats in my head, it's not a good thing. It, it, it's the worst thing. It, the, the Anything you add into the Washington Naval Treaty makes the task for the Germans that much worse. For the Italians, it probably means some Francisco Caracolas are completed. For the French, it's going to mean some Normandy or Lyons are completed, maybe. Um, basically, everything adds up. And when Germany tries to build anything, the trouble is for the Germans is what... You know, that's a mistake to say... But the, lim the, 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 the limitation on German construction in the 1930s is not their desire. It's treaty for until 1935. And from 1935 almost, it's their infrastructure. So they have to either invest a whole lot of money in their infrastructure, which they don't do because they're investing the money in their army and their air force, or they are building the same thing. So here is the basic problem. You have those 10, 40,000 ton ships appear for the Royal Navy maybe between 1920 and 19, 1922 and 1930. Which the British could have done because they could have done two, two launching every other year and kept their constant construction too and probably got them out, uh, out by 1930. And it would probably be an uh, interesting class of basically um, F3 style 16 inch gun ships. And with them keep working on the 16-inch guns, they're going to end up with 10. So you've got those 10 vessels in service, plus whatever's built in the 1930s. And then the Germans are going to go, well, yeah, we can come to see, and we've still got Bismarck and Turpus as the best thing. Sure. Um, you know, you are looking at a scenario where, honestly, the Germans could find themselves facing the Royal Navy with... 23, 24 capital ships in 1939 at their disposal because they wouldn't have got under those systems. They're not going to get rid of their Rs. They're not going to get rid of the Queen Elizabeth. They're not going to get rid of Hood, Renown, or Repulse. And they've got 10 fast battleships as well. Odds are when you're upgrade, if you've got them up to 28 knots, when you're upgrade, if you've got them at 28 knot ships, 
then when you're upgrading the Queen Elizabeth class, you're going to think of upgrading them to 28 knots so they can fit in with them as well. So that gives you 15 fast battleships, potentially. Three, three battle cruisers. And the five R's. As your base fleet in 1939. That's not good for the Germans to deal with. You know, that gives the Royal Navy eight more places they can have a capital ship. That's not good for the Germans. And that's before we get on to the whole carrier thing. If you've got able to have ten of those at 30,000 tons, because that's your limitation. So the Royal Navy should allow 300,000 tons of carriers. And everything below 14,000 tons is free. So Hermes, Argus, all sorts of things aren't included in the tonnage limitations. Then... You could be well talking about a Royal Navy which does have 10 30,000 ton carriers because that provides them with enough carriers to be present in all the oceans when they want to. And they might have another 10 14,000 ton carriers sitting around as well. They could quite easily have that. In which case they've got 20 carriers wandering around. The Royal Navy were the only Navy which came close to maxing out its carrier tonnage. In the 1930s. They were the ones who were closest to maximising their cumulative tonnage. Because the British always have the always want to build the ships. They might not necessarily build the best ships, but they'll always have the numbers of them. And that numbers is going to have a toll. That's going to mean extra carriers are available in Norway. That's going to mean extra carriers are available for... When you talk about anti submarine warfare operations, well, you've got the Hermes ones going out for that, so they'll be doing that. Not the fleet carriers... The fleet carriers won't be doing any submarine warfare hunting, so you won't lose a, glor a, glor a courageous like you did historically. You're going to have had more carriers built into the Navy from the beginning, so you're going to have more senior officer carrier officers and more experienced officers and personnel in terms that comes to damage control in the fleet. You're going to have more capital ships running around. You're probably going to have more of those carrier capital ship task forces, especially more fast capital ships for it. So the Royal Navy might have got to their final evolution, which they really like, just in an exercise of two carriers and two fast capital ships. So Force H is probably a pair and pair, for starters. Um, you probably, you might not have, Glorious might not be found where she is, because she might be running around in a pair and pair scenario, because again, there's going to be fast capital ships running around, there's going to be all these things. And the thing is also, you're going to have, that's before you get onto the effect on the county class. Because if they're able to be 14,000 tons in standard, they're going to be about 17,000 tons fully loaded. Again, the Deutschland class maxed it out for the German construction. So, if you've got the, them at 14,000 tons, if they're still on with 8-inch guns, that's a, definitely 12 8-inch guns. That might be as many as 15 18-inch guns on 5 triple turrets. Or they might go for better armor, or higher speed, or more endurance, or whatever they decide to go with. You have anything, any improvements you have in the Washington Naval Treaty have a disproportionate impact on the German Navy's capabilities to match into anything because of the fact that they are not limited by the Washington Treaty, they are limited by the Treaty of Versailles. Peter Dawson, the P1154 was a contemporary to TSR2 and cancelled about the same time. Yes, but there were all sorts of problems keep running on with it. So, whilst it's cancelled at the time and that project is does see, it theoretically cease at the same time, there are projects which come from it which keep on running. There is a, There, there was a supersonic Harrier some program running for quite a long time in the background. And it was looked at at various points historically, and there was all sorts of interesting efforts put into it. And basically, the public uh, there is, because they keep changing name, it's very much easier to just call it by its root name, which is it starts off with the root pro with the pro 1154 program. And so I usually use that as the catch-all name. Um, nice one. Would it be accurate to say the Russian pre dreadnoughts of the Black Sea and Battle of Fleets weren't designed for the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> The question, nice agree from the problem there is you're suggesting they were designed for any ocean. Um, they, they're an interesting formations. 
I theoretically could do operate notions, but not for a long time. And they needed they needed a lot of re repair and re resupply. They needed a lot of time in dry dock. Basically, they needed Saigon to be fully fitted up to Singapore standards and actually refit them all. Um. Nigerian, if USS Long Beach was 19,200 to 21, would every US cruiser, nuclear cruiser built after not be below 10,000 on standard? No, because if you're building everything that much bigger, they're gonna, it's going to be scalable. So they'll be built bigger as well. And also, I would point out that those, cru those ships weren't really built as cruisers. They are Destroyer leaders, which are redesignated cruisers. They are destroyer leaders, though, and there is a difference. No, sir. Would the Battle of Tsushima even happen if Kamchatka hadn't signaled to what it thought was a non combatant ship? Yes, because the Japanese were very much ready for them. No, sir. Well, British Dreadnought, would you compare the Ganga class, the Imp Empress of Maria class, and the Imperial Nikolai class to um, HMS Dreadnought herself? You can, broadly speaking, to any of the 12-inch gunships. But the moment you start getting to the 13.5-inch gunships, and definitely not the 15-inch gunships, they are not in their area. Uh, they are most closest to the Dante Alighieri. And the Italian vessel. Um, Nathan, what Royal Navy battleship of the 1910s could comfortably defeat Argentina's Rivadera class dreadnoughts? Of the 1910s, could comfortably uh, defeat an Everdera class. Um, basically, pick anything from Queen Elizabeth R class. They could do it without too much, without any problem. An Iron Duke, I'd probably put the money on the Iron Duke, but we'll leave that to one side. I don't know what battlecruisers are comparable to Russian Borodino class battlecruisers. Invincibles, Indefatigables, that sort of generation of ships. Azowski, what did the England get for themselves out of the Anglo-German naval treaty? Britain, I'm presuming you're talking. Uh, 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 out uh, a treaty, ask about pre-World War II one. Well, the Anglo-German naval treaty of 1935, what does it give the British? It gives the British access to what Germany is doing. What's often forgotten about that treaty is, yeah, the British have no faith the Germans are going to keep to it. But it, vaguely speaking, signs them up to the naval treaty standards. And more importantly, it get, allows the British access to wander around German yards completely openly. There is a lot you can get from covert intelligence. There is an also a lot of different information you can get from going around and seeing what they're prepared to show you. Because what they're prepared to show you often also highlights what they don't want you to see. And so then you know what to go and inspect. Or rather, investigate. So basically, the... Anglo-German Naval Treaty is a fishing expedition. It's a, we believe war is coming in about seven plus years. We think, have a highly likelihood that you guys are going to be on the other side of it. However, for now, we will let you think we are dumb so we can gather as much information about you as we want to. Case in point, the Germans didn't use the advantage to the opportunity to come and visit British yards. Whereas the British did go and visit Germany arts. Ah, uh, Vasilis Kiratos. I would like to ask about the best book about Russian Imperial Navy. Um, Russian Imperial Navy. Oh, frigate. Um, Russian Imperial Navy. Let me just send a WhatsApp message quite quickly. Just a quick one. Yes, I do have it on my phone and on my computer. And sometimes it's just easier to find it on my computer when I cannot find it on my phone.
Now, I have got somewhere a copy of Fred T. James, um, the James Russian Imperial Navy, which was last published in 1983. However, my preferred book is Anthony Watts's book, and that is published nineteen ninety. Um currently 47 pounds on Amazon and also currently in the possession of my mother who's reading it because <laughs> she's on a Russian she's on a Russian and Japanese well she was on a Japanese kick um, about the same time she discovered VTubers and she's gotten even more I have I, I was getting a full discussion of the Doki bird situation this morning from my mother, and I was going, I know about this because I've decided I could use it for teaching how ba how to badly manage PR. You have decided you have fans and actual stuff in this match. Okay. I, I love my mother. I really do. <laughs> but, um, Fred, J if you want a really good, or uh, let's put it this way. Jane, the Fred Jane's book is a very good contemporary analysis of the Imperial Russian Navy from the nineteen uh, from that period. The Watts account is a good, is a be, is what I consider a better introduction, and there is also a, a book written by Vladimir Krestanov, um, Krestanov, which was published in twenty thirteen. Which I would say is again a good book, but is very, very political. Um, it's more politically focused than I would consider navally focused in some regards, but it's still a very good book. So I hope that answers your questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. By the way, in the earlier modified Washington Naval Treaty happens, if the earlier in the earlier modified Washington Naval Treaty happens, what changes does it bring for Italy's navy? Do you think that they would build any carriers, even like uh, maybe even light carriers? Um. That's the thing, is if they do complete the Francisco Caracolas, then they probably will do the carriers. Do they do light carriers? No. Because for them, the seaplane carriers fulfill the light carrier duties. But I think they still, they build a fleet carrier, because there are going to be so many fleet carriers going around. It's, and it's Mussolini. Um... With that many fleet carriers going around, the odds are the French build, or can build or will build something, because the British will have so many, and the French will build it to try and get an advantage of the Italians. So the Italians will build one. It's it's gonna be itchy. Um, as I said, uh, small parin uh, parendum. Can't believe I'm searching uh, for this again. Um, a small pudendum viral syndrome will massively take over. And everyone will be worried about how long theirs looks next to a ruler. So they'll all be building, and they'll be building them. The moment you have the capacity to build more, the French will probably build at least one. Uh, the French already had the burn, they were building things extra to it. So they probably would do more. It's a fun time, basically. Take care, Don Giovanni. Uh, 
Um, Black Mass, what kind of impact would a successful and mass-produced P-154 by the British have had on the rest of the world in Air Force and Navies? Um, if you go with a P-154, you get a very different Invincible class. Uh, you probably get an Invincible class which is an extra 15 or so thousand tons, because that's going to be an actual viable strike aircraft with its speed and capabilities. And... That's going to change things. It's going to change things for the Americans, etc. Because if the P-154 becomes the baseline aircraft rather than the Harrier, then the Forger is going to the Forger is going to immediately start causing a small embarrassment for the Soviet Union, even more than it did historically. Um, yeah, it's. It's changes are going to be quite interesting, but also you might have things like would France go with a Charles de Gaulle if you've got a more viable Vistal option? Would they, would uh, what would that change in terms of how the Royal Navy and other navies acted in terms of their development of capabilities? Would the Japanese maybe have got into it from the get go? And then you've got the fact that you've got Sweden, you've got other powers who are looking for a rough ship capable scenario. They might well be looking at that and go, well, we need to push that development. So could change development of the Gripen. It'd be interesting, is what I'd say. It would be interesting. And, uh, question 25.5. So if they uh, destroy leaders, so if they'd be... Long Beach is a cruiser hull. Lehi class are destroyer leaders. So I'm not sure why you've got them going bigger than Long Beach. I'm saying they, they wouldn't be small, but I don't think they'd be 20,000 plus tons. Um, if we consider as historically... The Leia class, which are built on destroyer hulls, are 7,800 tons fully loaded. Long Beach fully loaded is 15,540 tons. So you've added on 5,000 tons to Long Beach. Okay. The odds are, if you've got the bit a far bigger Albany class, and, well, you've got the Farragut class, which are... Also there. I would say you're probably looking at something which is going to be about 12 to 14, 12,000 tons, 12 to 14,000 tons. As it was historically there, roughly fully loaded is 7,000 tons, uh, 7,700, which is roughly half what a Long Beach is. If Long Beach is now 20, 21,000 tons, then they are probably going to be 10, 11 to 12, uh, 12,000 tons. And the reason I'm saying that is not 10,000 tons is because you are not going to be going for a 10,000 ton margin at that point. You're going to either go under it or over it. So they're probably going to go for about 11,000 tons.
Yeah, um... That, don't take this the wrong way, but the room you may are, which you've just put in, they ain't probably use on the Hoofy NATO navies. I, I haven't heard anything, but also there's the fact that whilst I'm sure the Hoofy will be claiming credit for it, their missile struck it on the 18th of February, which is... Let's be honest. Uh, about one week, two weeks, about two weeks ago, and it's finally sunk due to a storm. So I would say, again, that's more... Um... And it was abandoned. And they hadn't conducted salvage and towing operations. Yeah, I, I don't really... I, again, I think that's more of a damage control issue than the Hoofy actually managed to sink it. It's more of a issue as in frigate that's going to have an environmental impact on the Red Sea. That's going to be expensive to clear up. That's annoying. Then it's uh, the Hoofy sunk something, so we need to deal... We need to be proportional about this. It's more of a case of... <sighs> frigate... And I know the Hoofy were making all sorts of statements about, oh, if you try and move out of doing aid, we will intercept you, etc. But if you're towing it with a... If you've got a towing ship towing it and you've got a salvage crew aboard and you've got an Arleigh Burke sitting next to it, there ain't anything from the Hoofies getting through. Question, I think that is very wrong. Question 26. What are you comparing to? You're saying if the British sold Lock Frigate in numbers of 17 to France, 8 to Brazil, and, each, uh, and Brazil, uh, Greece each, 6 to Netherlands, 4 to Republic of China, 3 and Chile, 3 to Italy, 2 to Uruguay, Ecuador, and Japan, and 1 to the Thais, are they better? Uh, I got ships. That's useful, but better than what? What's the comparison you're asking against? Is that then they traditionally had? Well, if you have more ships, that is more useful. Can you operate them? Do you have the crew for them? Do you have the funding to keep them operating? Those things all have to be answered. In simple terms, that's not a question you can answer. That's a question which is just uh. There. Well, yeah, they have the hulls. Can they use them? Will they put decent people in charge of them? Will they have decent crews? Will they ha be sitting in harbour doing nothing? Or will they actually be out operating and training? All these things are factors before you can say if they'll be better. So I did two or three videos on the Ruby Art. Yeah. Instead of the US data destroyer, uh, escort destroyers sold to them in the original timeline. Um... Honestly, it's much. It's half a dozen one, six of the other. The things the lock class are better in is things that the uh, there are things that the E's are better in. So it's half a dozen one, six of the other. It's it's, it's really not a earth shattering thing. Pete Dawson, I did, in the uh, nicest way, I did say it was to be about 10,000 tons, but they're not going to pick 10,000 tons because of the fact that at that point they're, not, they're either going under or over, so they probably go over, which is why I said eleven to 12,000 tons. I did say that. So I'm not sure why you felt the need to... Um... write that in the chat, but that's up to you. Jack Ryan, I'm ending a suck ship off no damage control, reminds me of Billy Mitchell does. Yeah, it's just if the if there's no crew aboard and it's not it's not getting proper damage control and a storm breaks up, it's gonna sink. It happens. It's not nice, but it does.
Um, Gerwin, the original design for the 20s emblem was apparently supposed to have four twin, uh, four twin mounts for the main battery. Were these fully enclosed turrets a twin shield mount or something else entirely? I think they were supposed to be turrets. Um, they did op op they did oscillate between the options, but I think the design they were happy with for the emblem would have been turrets. Um, But as it was, she ended up with what I would probably call mounts, I think. Uh, yeah, mounts. She ended up with mount, a set of, uh, with um, eight single mounts. Because basically they decided to spread out the firepower. And I, did, I think they did look at turrets, but they went with mounts. Honestly, Knight Six Eight Three One, you have t you are going, you are trying to do too much with too little information. So let me explain something. Um, even me, when I'm trying to make the changes, I'm guessing to an extent, but I'm basing it on they've otherwise kept everything the same. They've just been building them larger. So you have to go. With, you have to presume that. But the reality is that wouldn't be the case. If you're able to build much bigger ships. That's going to change your design practices. That's going to change what you require from your designs. Or rather, what you can get to get your designs to do, so therefore what you require from them. If you've got a ship which is an extra, is 15,000 tons, in, so let's say your standard elimination limit is 15,000 tons rather than 10,000 tons for your cruisers. And your heavy cruisers. Well, then, as I've said before, you could be looking at at least four triple turrets, if they're 8 inch, maybe five triple turrets. And that's even on a British design. The Americans might want to push that even more. So that's the scenario you're dealing with. And what do they want them to do? Do they want them to operate more aircraft? Do they want them to have a more heavy forward armament? Do they want to have a central gun? Do they want an aft heavy armament? What do they, where do they want their armament? That's going to affect their design. What kind of speed do they want? Do they decide that, well, hang on, we can actually put this extra tonnage into more speed so we can get our crews up to 40 knots. Do they decide they want to go that direction? There are all sorts of options you can do with the extra tonnage. So the thing is, we can't really predict beyond... This is why I always am very strict about where I end alternate histories. I always try and say, well, look, this is the point at which you can go no further. You're just doing a fiction writing at this point. Because you've gone so far away from historical. And that's the problem for you. And If they are building ships which are as standard that much bigger, destroyers are that much bigger, Cruisers are that much bigger. Destroyer leaders will be that much bigger. The baseline ships will be that much bigger. That's going to impact into today. Because the things you're going to expect of those ships versus the things you're going to expect of ships today is going to be bigger. Sal, so, yeah... Well, so Calvin Gansberg, yes, Sal has said the ship was good, would be hard to salvage. There is a very different phraseology between hard to salvage and impossible to salvage. And whilst, yes, the engine room was too deep in the water, that doesn't make it impossible. And if salvage work had started immediately, if the crew hadn't been hadn't abandoned ship, or rather they'd been replaced by a salvage crew who started working, she'd been taken in tow by a tug, and she'd been got into harbour. She's been da she was damaged two weeks ago. She'd have been in harbour long before the storm, and she'd have probably been fine. And yes, they're still launching stuff, but... Again... Carl, you're holding people to an impossible standard. The Germans were still launching stuff in World War II, when they are being bombed a lot more proportionally heavier, and there were British troops advancing on them. And American troops advancing on them. And they were still launching V1s and V2s at London. 
So... Yeah, just because you're being bombed, where's this idea that you go in and bomb someone, you can immediately declare peace because they've been bombed? I, I realize there has been a vogue, but it, it's, it doesn't work like that. There's the example I always give is of Kosovo, where the Serbs retreated with more equipment than we thought they had in Kosovo. And we found out that we hadn't destroyed a single piece of their their military equipment because they'd hidden it so well. We had done a lot of bombing and had damaged a lot of infrastructure. We hadn't managed to take out the Serb troops because they'd been hiding things like tanks in garages and all sorts of things. The idea that you can bomb someone and it's going to stop everything is not the case, but sometimes you're bombing them not for that purpose. You're bombing them to degrade their launching abilities, to make it not as capable, and that is one of the things you have to, you will notice since the bombing campaign, is honestly the Houthis haven't been able to mount as coordinated operations as they probably would have liked. Bad guy eight it two nine. It's treasure. It's budget season. Okay. If and I do say this on a regular basis, there are always going to be silly stories going around in budget season. The odds of the Royal Navy or any of the British government selling off HMS Prince of Wales at this point are very low. Queen Elizabeth is currently having to be fixed, and Prince of Wales is at sea. Hence, someone's le uh, done a story about selling her. Uh, what about the fear of selling her off? Now, this could have been leaked for one of three reasons. It could have been leaked by someone who wants to get more funding for the Navy because they want to show, uh, they want to highlight the role of carriers and have lots of people writing in papers going, no, 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 carriers are useful doing this. It could have been someone le who's anti the Navy who wants to use that funding and defense for something else and seeing if it gets traction if people actually support it. It could have been completely created by someone in the press and you, whilst I would love to believe all journalists are the same calibre as Jamie Seedal, I have met some of them and I have seen some of the stories put in the press about defence over the years and so that and finally and this is an important thing to consider it could have been and this is going to, this is going to sound strange someone putting it out because it distracts from another story as an option. It's something which isn't going to happen, but so many people get outraged about this over here, they don't notice what that's going that's going on over there. So yeah. I don't I don't think HMS Prince of Wales is going to be sold off. Carl, yeah, I'm not getting into that with you. Uh, you and I have very different views, and I have watched you sometimes talk about these things, um, the stuff, and you take a lot of information as being good information when it's not. And I respect you, and I respect you having different views, but yeah, the Saudis sent that ground troops. That was the... Saudi intervention in Yemen a few years back and yeah that's also the other problem that you are conflating Yemen with Houthis and the Houthis are the rebels um, there's all sorts of issues with that but yeah it's it's like some, some of the stuff that's being said on news at the moment in defense terms it's just blatantly stupid it sounds smart if you know nothing about it. And it's just not something I want to get into.
Lamar's most Maximus. The British Empire is given the blueprints and several examples of the armoured vehicle general purpose uh, of armoured vehicle AVGP. In 1944, what would they do? Black and Maximus, I, I, I hate to say this to you, but remember I'm a naval historian, okay? So you've just said armoured vehicle general purpose, and in my head I'm going through, there are about five different programmes I know about which have had vaguer things around that title. You're going to have to be slightly more specific. Who's armoured vehicle general purpose? Um, so, you, you, I, I'm presuming you're talking about the pro... I'm, I'm going to presume, I'm going to jump in here and go, you're going to go with a lav. Um, in which case, they would probably quite like that idea. Um, but the uh, there are other options out there and that provides them with something which is interesting but honestly there's also a limit to what they can produce and I think that's probably going, most going to interest them is the engine if they are 275 horsepower uh, destroyed diesel um, Two cylinder turbocharged diesel engine. Um, that that that's going to interest them. That is going to interest them a lot. No, Carl, but you are pro trying to provoke a discussion of current political affairs in a history channel, and I tolerate it to an extent. but you're pushing the toleration. Which is, and I hesitate to use this, a bit rude. And the discussions I don't mind having with you personally, one-on-one -on -one and chatting away, are very different than the discussions I'm going to have in a, on a history channel, asking naval, answering naval history questions on a Sunday afternoon on a video like this. So, yeah, I would actually could, could go far as saying you're being very rude. I try and allow a certain leeway and answer a couple of questions, and I'm happy to answer them, ship salvaging and those sort of things, yes. And the thing is, my, always my instinct as a lecturer is to try and answer questions. But at a certain point, I have to remember these things are, well, not the topic of the conversation. And whilst you're apologising now, you were rude to go into it. Because, again, this is a naval history ch question, uh, channel. And it's not the first time I've had to say something. So I'd prefer it not to happen again. If it's the 60 series ones, then they're, they're, they're a decent vehicle. But I think it's going to interest the British most in terms of the armoured vehicle general purpose is going to be its engine. They can use that more than anything else. Everything else will be kind of useful, but the jet engine will be great. Thank you, Blackman. I suppose for clarifying it was the Canadian Navy GP. You probably get a lot of vehicles built which are based off using that engine. Because if we consider... Let's say the Matilda 2. She's a fine vehicle. Her engine is... ...190 brake horsepower. 
So imagine put and it's a six cylinder or a it's basically a Leyland engine. Um, yeah, so 190 brake horsepower add on to and make it 275 of brake horsepower. You are going to increase that vehicle's capabilities massively. You know, they could do a maximum speed of 15 miles an hour off on road, nine miles per hour on, on uh, nine, uh, nine miles per hour off road. You add basically 95, so that's 50% more power horsepower for actually a, probably a slight decrease in weight looking at your engine weights. You have given you and a far more reliable engine. You haven't given yourself a true advantage. So, um, so, have you heard any plans or rumors on new R in Corvette based on somewhat stretch of a OPV? No. Uh, basically, they, there's, it always comes up. People are always putting forward the Black Swan class or various other ideas of sloops and stretched OPVs. The fact is, British have the Type 31. Then there's going to be Type 32, which is going to be an adapted Type 31 design. They've got Type 26 in production. Once that's gone for it, it's going to be Type 83. It, it, there isn't really much space. There will probably be another class of OPVs built at some point. Probably there'll be river batch freeze, but you know, that happens. Could they have actually manufactured the engine in the 1940s? It's a lot of technology. Um, it, if you have detailed enough blueprints, you can probably do quite a lot of that technology, because again, it's going to sound pretty cruel but the lav engine as um, lovely a vehicle and a lovely an engine as it is is not what you consider the most um, in it's sort of in a nice way the most modern of engines. Um, it's um, it's a typical military scenario, and then they go for a very reliable engine, which has been around for quite a while. That is what the uh, that is what most militaries tend to do. They don't tend to go for. There are certain things they will change around for, but. So, yeah. That's been around a while. Yeah, that, that's been around since about... Ooh. Probably in, uh, probably in the 1960s. So yeah, it, it's it's not going to be easy, but if they've got decent enough plans, they can do it. I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking the electronics, the ignition and timing circuits. Those things are all things they could make workarounds for it wouldn't necessarily be perfect mission they can sort of do uh, timing circuits hmm. cow part I don't care what dragon was the beanie suits yeah I, I 
this is gonna sound strange, but um, I got up, showered, of course, did everything, but um, I I I I I then cleaned, I then did all the work on the house, got showered in black dust, washed as much of it out of my care as possible, and then it's still coming out at the moment, so I'm gonna have to shower again, but ran out of time before I had um a la I, I I had a live, and I noticed it back when I was watching the um uh the video I was doing earlier, the um, Twitch stream, I kept watching uh, seeing black dust coming out of my hair, and I just went, I'm going to wear a beanie. I'm going to wear something to keep it in, <laughs> and then I'll go and shower again. Yeah, it's basically, it's the similar to the commercial turbine for the Perry class. You go, uh, Calvin goes back, you go with what is available. Uh, could... Uh, uh, yeah, we could do a Bill Trump's live at some point. That w that would make sort of more sense to do something with Bill Trump's, uh, because Bill Trump's is where I deal with the modern stuff, and this is one of the reasons why, again, I get tempted by answering the modern questions because I do that in Bill Trump's and I do teach war studies. But I also know that YouTube comes down hard on you if you go out of your lane too much, and if I go out of the history education lane too much, I get notes and have to deal with them so this is one reason why again i <clears throat> i have to remind myself not to answer the questions and i have it you know basically i go look i i know i was telling off carl a bit earlier but it's because i'm and my natural inclination is always ask the questions and trying to always answer the questions and want to get involved in answer the questions and that's why i have the rules in place to protect me because it will upset youtube So, uh, uh, Batch 2 Rivers, sorry. Um, we're on to Batch 2 already. It's, it'll be the Batch 3 Rivers. And the Batch 3 Rivers actually might be slightly better arm, but that's mainly because we've got 57 mm and 40 mm to pick from. It's already in service on Type 31, so they're probably going to get that to an extent. Um... Um, nice to hear everyone. Question 27. What would it take to get the British Empire to plan to build a 153 River class on an 82 Lock class and assuming Warfare Frigates and 26 Bay class Air Defense Frigates pre-World War II? Um, for them to build those, well, A, they... You have to remember the River class are a product of... Uh, all those River Frigates are a product of wartime experience plus the construction experience of building the flowers. Okay? So they are... Military, they are civilian standards plus. So to build them earlier, you have to get somehow find a way to give the Royal Navy that experience, that knowledge, and so they can form to build those those instead of the flower class. And that's pretty much what you're asking. So for that to happen, you'd have had to have had a crash build of something like the flower class earlier, had war experience, and then have World War Two. So you'd have had to probably have the Abyssinia incident or something turn hot. Or something happen with Japan. Something which required them to build some flower class sloops. Come on, uh, you are still allowed to call me Gaz too. Glad to hear it. And uh, all questions you can say it's build territory. Alright. But you know me. I like to ask the, answer the questions. So it's being cruel. It, 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 asking me the questions, you know... Mm. Being cruel. <sighs> yeah. Um, I, let's put it this way. So, the the floorboards I've been taking up and doing, and one of the reasons why I'm drinking quite as much iron brew as I am this evening, is that it's um, it's the underlay which was underneath the underneath the carpet, and it was laid in the 1970s when the carpet was laid. Yay. And it hasn't been changed since. Um, it's actually it's, it's a quite clean carpet. It wasn't that mucky, considering it's the carpet which was underneath my te a desk and books and all sorts of things originally in my bedroom, and then was underneath boxes. And I've had to move all the boxes out of the way and had to move, uh, take a bookshelf, a couple of bookshelves down. 
and had to roll, to roll it all back. Lovely. I know. But um, I've done that. But then I got the, the underfloor, the underlay has turned entirely to powder. It's not in any lumps at all. It's entirely gone to powder. It's gone from being a whatever the underlay was made of, I think it was presumably rubber or something, to a fine mist powder. So if you can imagine, that's me working in it. I've managed to clog up the hoover twice. I've had to replace its filters twice to cleaning this stuff out. I've emptied more hoover loads than I want to think about. I'm wearing a face mask, eye protectors, and because it's easier, I'm actually doing it with out a shirt on and everything like that. So I'm just saving on stuff which is getting caked. Um, I've managed to cake two pairs of tracksuit bottoms and the shirt when the first day I was working on it, which is why I didn't wear a shirt today while working on it. And I basically come out of it covered in black. So, uh, black, the black soot. It's just everywhere. It just... And, um... You come out, you look almost like you've been in volcanic ash. It's that sort of colour once you're, it's, it's on you. And then you yeah, have the shower it off, and yeah. Yeah, run, uh, rubber underlay. Yeah, it just disintegrates. It's fun. I think I'll be chatting for a while. I don't think you'll miss clothes out, Runon. I, I, I plan on keeping going till at least 1100 out of 2300 hours. So there's at least another... Probably about at, le at least another 45, 50 minutes. Mainly because I enjoy doing the questions, and I've got to get to the books at some point. Um, Listen, how did the British Empire miss the two-year row in the United States go over a ch Navy over a cheap ocean-going escort? Mainly by sitting and watching it, but also the Royal Navy was producing the sloops. That's the thing. The Royal Navy is always producing sloops. So they have a row, but their row is they're always building sloops and a new design of sloops each year to test out the idea options. So it's a case of the sloop production for the Royal Navy is both a safety valve and a testing program. How great of an impact would the blueprints of for the modern MRE have on the world if sent back to 1913 distributed around the world? Um, why do you not like people in the past? I'm not saying the food is that much better back then. Hey, look, if the thing is, if you could get MREs meal uh, meals ready to eat, of course, and the idea for how to make them, etc., back into the past and sufficiently back into the 1930s, then most nations would probably be stockpiling things like that as part of their war preparations, which for Britain could mean a, di a great, very great difference in terms of its wartime worries about food supplies. Because MREs can last for a very long time. Let's see. And basically, you had the cat, the sea ration was, was sort of used in use from about nineteen thirty eight. Um, that was then replaced by the meal combat individual and then the meals ready to eat. So, you know, you, you could have had some stockpiling going on. It'd be interesting to see what would happen. It might, it might be slightly better. It might be slightly worse. Okay, the modern menu for meals ready to eat. I just thought I'd look this up for you all. Chili with beans, shredded beef barbecue, uh, shredded barbecue beef, I mean, uh, chicken with egg noodles and vegetables, spaghetti with meat sauce, 
chicken chunks, beef taco, beef brisket, meatballs and marinara sauce, beef stew, chili and macaroni, vegetable, uh, vegetarian taco pasta, El elbow macaroni and tomato sauce, cheese tortellini, spinach mushrooms and cream sauce fettuccine. Mexican style chicken stew, chicken burrito bowl, maple sausage, beef ravioli, jalapeno pepper, jack beef, uh, beef patty, Italian sausage with vegetables, lemon pepper tuna, beef goulash, pepperoni pizza slice, and southwest beef and black beans. From personal experience of having the the few I have sampled, I would say the pepperoni pizza slice was a disappointment. It wasn't enough pepperoni, it wasn't enough pizza. Um, the beef brisket was quite nice, and the shredded barbecue beef was actually pretty nice. Uh, I honestly took one whiff of the, I think it was the spinach, mushrooms, and cream sauce fettuccine and decided that I would rather face horrendous, horrendous pain than actually touch it. Take care, Cody85. But it's, it's, it's worse if you go back to the early MREs. They are... Oh, good lord. <laughs> oh, oh. That's just not good. The 1981-87 menu is just not good. Please, no one start sending me MREs. I, I, I've, I, I had that when I had to have it, and I will have it if I have to have it, but I would rather not have it through choice. You have a choice between death and eating this MRE. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. You see, you, you say you have the choice between death and eating this MRE. No, I also have the choice of eating the person who's trying to give me that MRE. Because there is no way I would be carrying that MRE. So I have the choice between death, eating that MRE, or cannibalism. There is always another option. Falcano. Uh, always another option. Um. <laughs> Jack Ray, the MREs I've had were fine. Yeah. But guys, you know, post World War Two, did the SN or RN buy in an, an other county ships or plants? Um. Both of them have bought other nations' plans recently. But usually they're the sellers, not the buyers. Um, but both, when buying the uh, the basis for the Constellation Frigate and a Type 31 are foreign purchased. <laughs> uh... I was just kidding. Nailers and tries World War II Nailers Fleeves. No, there's a reason I, I, I tell you all to go to Drac when you do that. For starters, there's two advantages he has. One, he does drink alcohol. So he can be far more accurate than me on that scenario because I don't. And secondly, he has control. He, he doesn't share a kitchen with two people who are allergic to almost everything, it seems. Uh, my mum is allergic to, well, in her old age, in her um, advancing years, has developed allergies to garlic, all sorts of things as a result of her asthma. She's got allergy-induced asthma, which is different from asthma somehow, but I've never been quite sure how, but it seems to be worse in some regards, better in others. Uh, basically, it's asthma, but you know what sets it off. Um, and curry and all sorts of things she's allergic to the spices of, etc. And my sister is allergic to gluten and dairy. So I have to regularly na navigate the minefield of a kitchen where my sister will put chili and spices on everything so it tastes actually remotely nice. Because quite a lot of gluten and dairy food tastes like gluten-free and dairy-free food tastes like cardboard. 
And my mum is allergic to everything. My sister is putting on her food to make it taste nice. But my mum can eat gluten and dairy. So if you then add me in the middle, also experimenting and adding on food and doing World War Two era food, I would probably kill one or the other. So <laughs> that's not happening for this channel. I love you all. I love doing good history. I have no desire to kill my family members because of it. <laughs> oh. I saw the Soviet surplus shortly after the fall. I now understand why they drank so heavily. It made things easier. Um, that's right. Would it be accurate to describe the Royal Navy's throwing of corvettes, sloops, escort destroyers, frigates, and frigates at Nazi U boats as an act of panic and desperation? No. Considering they were planning to do that, and that's how they planned to fight the war against those submarines, against those submarines from the beginning, that's not desperation. That's what they were planning on doing, and that's what they did, and it worked. And they didn't really throw them at them; they used them to escort the convoys. And when the German submarines actually found the convoy, they used them. They they tried to fight off the fight them off, and often quite successfully. Let's be honest, there are quite a few sloops which are very good killing machines of submarines. They knock up a fair number of U-boats. The Black Swans are most famous for that. There's quite a few of the Corvettes do fairly well. And a, a lot of the other vessels in that do fairly well against the summer U-boats. And again, what's a win for, us, uh, for an escort? Is a win for an escort... Uh, is it a win for an escort sinking the U-boat? Or is it driving the U-boat off so the convoy gets through? Again, that's the other thing you always have to consider in your matrix. Killing a submarine, killing a U-boat is good. Yes, you're all happy with it. But you don't need to kill it to win that battle as far as, uh, as, far as escort is concerned. You need to drive that U-boat off. Keep it underwater and drive it on so it can't intercept. Because the moment the U-boat's on the surface to try and chase down a convoy... That's when it's weakest versus aircraft and surface escorts. Sorry. <laughs> um, was that step up in gun size? Wouldn't they become defunct corvettes? As last week you mentioned, gun size was a defining line between OPV and VET when discussing bullion. Uh, gun size and missiles. If they've just gone up gun, they're not they're not call that. If they start having missiles as well, then there's an issue. Paul Best one follow on OPVs, rivers are through rivers battery might be more modular, thus allowing them to operate autonomous MCM If that's the case, you might see them more than the current five. The thing is that role's gonna be given is fo being folded into the type thirty two. That's basically the difference between Type 31 and 32. Type 32 is going to be able to operate the MCM role. It's going to be able to do that with the fleet and operate a range of uncrewed assets. So basically, the other uh, you could call in a nice way, this is the point you could make about it, is that the Type 32 is going to be a drone command frigate. Um, or drone, a drone control frigate. Type 31 is your flak frigate. Type 32 is going to be a drone control frigate. And the Type 26 is going to be your anti submarine warfare and point defense frigate. Your Type 83 is going to be your general purpose aerial air defense frigate destroyer. Slash, probably pretty much a cruiser in all but name. Uh, nice statement. Would it make sense if the RN had a transport equal to the UK's Navy now? Sorry, Skytrain to transport jet. Um, the British, the Royal, the Royal Navy does. Um, Uh, 
the Royal Navy has the jet streams. Um, and develop into... If we go to Royal Navy Aircraft, it's jet streams. So sleep list of aircraft. List of aircraft. The Royal Navy at current has seven or fifty squadron observer training jet streams, which also occasionally do that role. So, yeah, and so does the Royal Air Force have some similar things. So, that's what I use. The Royal Navy doesn't need to have its own because it's not as large as the US Navy, so it doesn't operate its own permanently. But the, um, yeah, I'm fairly certain I've heard stories about the jet streams at Culled Rose being used for those roles. Um, yeah, they're now, actually not jet streams, they use the Beechcraft Avenger T1s now, don't they? That's what they upgrade into. That's what they operate now. Same squadron, isn't it? Yeah, it's the same squadron. It's, same, it's still Beechcraft Avengers. It's the same, it's, it's still 750 squadron. Um, yeah. 824 squadron, this month squadron. And then we have eight four five, eight four six, which are both the, which are the marine um, squadrons for supporting uh, for supporting basically the um, medium lift helicopters for marine uh, for marine deployments. Uh, eight two five is the merged conversion training squadron for Wildcats. Yeah. And, of course, the Royal Navy has 700X as well. But, yeah, 750. So, uh, sorry, I went through all the different training squad uh, squadrons the Royal Navy has, and I'm fairly... It's 750, which are the ones who do, who do weird stuff. Do you use embassy protection when at home, Peter Lawson? Um... Sometimes, in terms of the protocols I use when it comes to making sure things are clean. Um, and that sounds weird, but it's a case of, uh, I would rather, I'm very careful to make sure certain certain systems are completely cleaned. To make sure there's no cross-contamination between my mum's food and my sister's food. It's even more fun when my sister's cooking for my mum, because she can be allergic to some, she has to wear gloves sometimes. Uh, fan count. I've been listening to Alice Lemon Cleans, the HRC of this disease, um, after a whole bridge. And I wonder if there's any historical based naval fiction series you recommend. Um, recommend is Drink Water series. I've always liked them. The Drink Water series are good. Um, right on. Weirdest improvised gun ammunition you're aware of? Ooh, good lord. 
let me put it this way. In the nicest way, when you've been making shrapnel for cannon to fire, people have used all sorts of things they have shoved in. Um, all sorts of things. I do remember one story of someone, and this was definitely, this was in the Napoleonic Wars, and I think it was a British soldier got hit by a ladle. Fired from a cannon. Um, or rather, at the, sort of the end of a ladle sort of thing. but A cooking ladle thing. But um, I'm not 100% sure about that story. I think... Well, I can definitely imagine them being... I think everything being loaded in by any... Just grabbing whatever's available. But I'm not sure anyone, any cook would let you fire his ladle at the enemy. There again, the cook might have given you the ladle to fire at the enemy. Because they might have destroyed his stew. Um... I say reference. Why were there only two Type Four Hunt class escort destroyers built? And um, modern ships are not boring. Modern ships are designed for various reasons, but usually it's uh, various. Uh, basically, their shape is often designed by a desire to minimise their return on certain bands of radar frequency. Not boring. It's quite a lot of science which has to go into it. It's just it's not as interesting or emotive often as older ships. And two Type 4s built because they didn't need to build anymore. By that time they're building better things. Let's put it, by that point let's be honest, you are building enough of the Castle Class Corvettes and the River Class Frigates and the various frigate types and you're building enough of the dis full turret destroyers why do you need to destroy escorts? That's the thing is, if you're building this in sufficient numbers and this in sufficient numbers why do you need the thing that sits in the middle? The thing that sits in the middle is the insurance, the, uh, insurance for either if this or the one or the thing above it isn't bringing, coming in enough numbers, or the thing below it isn't coming in enough numbers. It can fit between both rolls. But if you have both of those enough numbers, you don't need it. It becomes like the fourth rate. You have enough third rates and fifth rates, why do you need, another, why do you need fourth rates? You have a couple because they're useful, but you don't have a lot of them. Um, Siglock. Okay, question one. Germany gets agreement with Japan in 1935 to purchase Ryujo to give them carry experience. We ignore the fact that uh, fact, uh, the, um, ignore. Oh, good lord. You want me to ignore him? Okay, I'll ignore him. Oh, that takes a lot of effort, though, to ignore him. He's big. He is big. Let's be honest. I would also say he's, you know, particularly interesting as a personality to try and what's track through his roles, but leave that alone. Ignoring him. Would the R and B amuse or concerned? Let me put it this way. The R N would be concerned in to an extent as this would show a far bigger emphasis on carriers coming from the Germans, which would mean the British would have to respond. So expect the British to be ramping up carrier construction. So, in a nice way, when the, 19, the moment 1937 naval treaty comes through, which doesn't limit cumulative tonnages, expect them to go absolutely mm, on the number of carriers they're building. You also, therefore, change Norway quite a bit because you have German naval aviation involved. The British are going to not be operating their carriers as independent uh, for anti submarine warfare. They're going to be combining them for their anti-carrier ops. So they're going to be operating combined task forces. You're probably going to have pairs of carriers off doing pairs of carrier duties. And yeah, you're probably going to have a carrier on carrier fight. And the British are going to prep for that. So that could cause um, a lot of fun. What is the largest non-US warship or submarine that is a museum? I 
I think... I think that's gonna be that's gotta be the Macassar. Yeah, I, I'm fairly certain it's the Macassar, which is the largest non-American warship preserved, because Belfast is only ten is not that big. Um, and no one else has a battleship hanging around. Yeah, um, it's Macassar. And I turn, question 32. How many Type 4 cluster destroyers were actually planned? Um, I think they had a similar batch in mind as the batch freeze, but again, it was contingent on the delivery of the R's, etc. The delivery of the rivers and delivery of the, delivery of the rivers and deliveries of the um, C uh, the C class uh, uh, war, war emergency destroyers. Look, Falconer, you have to remember, Fat Boy Fun Boy number one is Henry VIII. Fat Boy Fun Boy number two is, of course, our good friend Mussolini. Fat Boy Fun, aspiring Fat Boy Fun Boy number three is Hermann Goering. Never actually gets to be a Fat Boy Fun Boy because he always ha he's always second act. He's never front place. But he does work on being a fat boy and a fun boy. He does work on being those things. Um, Julia Hamm, do I recommend Sir Reginald Custance's The Ship of the Line in Battle, 1913, a collection of his lectures at the Royal Naval War College as a worthwhile read? It's certainly something interesting. It's worthwhile reading from the point of view of considering what was being digested at the time of discussion. That is, uh, you know, we get we, we focus in on Mahan and Corbett because they're the big names who have travelled through the periods. But there are lots of names around them in the period who are also being discussed and who are feeding into their discussions. And Custis is one of those. Oh, kind of, to be fair, I forgot about Henry Dave. How could you forget about Fat Boy Fun Boy number one? He's so fat and so fun. No, the Kiev class Minsk Aviation Group is a theme park, but it's closed and in China. Yeah, uh, w look, in the nicest way, the ships which go end up in China, we will leave to one side respectfully, because there is all sorts of things going on there I'm not getting involved with. Not on this channel. That's far more a build trans discussion. Where I can be fully cynically and sarcastic. I don't know, World War II fought with technology from six years in advance, like tech from 1945 and 1949, etc. Um, 1946 and 1940. Uh, that's that's going to change things quite a lot, because let's be honest, the allied tech moves forward a lot more than the Axis tech. Um, and there is a reason for that. Um... Let, let's be honest, the Allies are far more successful at pooling their resources and working together to develop stuff than the Axis ever are. So whilst there are pockets where the Axis get a lot stronger individually, they don't pool their technological development. Um, they really don't. So what you'd have in terms of, let's say, British ships in 1939, if they're armed as they would be in 1945... Their anti-submarine warfare capability is going to be far greater, all those sort of things. Yes, the Germans will have far better submarines, but the sheer 
number of submarines they have versus the number of ships the British will have and be able to feed on 1939 and the capabilities they have. Because whilst you've got a technology, you've still got the same infrastructure issues, whichever end you go through for, the, uh, for them. The infrastructure the British will have in 1940, uh, would have had for all that amount. Uh, y you've got a very different scenario. You've got a very, very different scenario. You've got a very different... You've got... The British having some very good fighter aircraft in service for their carriers, which are going to outclass some of the land-based equivalents. You have got... Probably a duel of jet fighters going on uh, uh, over the uh, from land to sort of the attack, and that's going to be interesting because again the British push forward a bit faster in that in some regards. It's it's going to be a higher tech, more scary thing, but also the other big thing you've got to realize is that in 1939, if the British have the tech they have in 1945. Which, I know it's joint tech, but in 1945, jointly, they have nuclear weapons with the Americans. It's a joint project. It's a joint program. I know there are all sorts of issues and all sorts of things happen afterwards, and it gets... The Americans basically kick the Brits out and think that that's going to stop the Brits developing nuclear weapon. And they turn around and realize that about 50% of the people, more than 50% of the people involved in the project in various stages were the British, and the British had also given quite a large chunk of research to development of the program. Um... The Americans had also given their own research, but the thing is, the British already had copies of that research. So, and had quite a lot of up-to-date information on the program to start off with, so the British were un unsurprisingly quite quick to go, Hello, we have nuclear weapons too. And the Americans went, uh, but you weren't supposed to be able to develop them, because we were going to the only ones who had them. Yeah. Whereas the Americans worked out, and I did, do remember having this conversation with an American official historian, uh, that if the Americans had actually kept the British in the program and kept the program joint and not chucked the British out, the British might, uh, the, they might have taken the British far longer to actually get their own nuclear weapons. Because the Americans could have done all sorts of stalling actions and things to, you know, to go, well, uh, yeah, but you don't want to start building them until you can get an even better weapon and da 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 and keep working on the H bomb and all sorts of things. And actually could have had far more influence and control, but by kicking the British out, they basically, um, forced the British hand, and the French hand, and pretty much all their allies' hands in developing their own systems. So that's interesting. Uh, yes, and the trouble is then, if the British have that in 1939, the Germans have the V2 as well, and whilst they can be firing that, the British might go, well, hang on, what happens if they develop a nuclear weapon? And we better use that first, in which case you might see a um, very irradiated Germany. And I'm not talking about Churchill, I'm talking about Chamberlain. Because Chamberlain is a broken man who is hurt at hurting in 1939, hunting around for an option. And, um... Yeah, it, he breaks and calls on, Chir and, and calls on Churchill and Halifax to work out who's going to take over from him. But... There is also the other option he could have quite easily broken and gone for reach for the nuclear button. Yes, that's pretty much it. We need a US version of South Humphrey Appleby to helpfully stall the British. And the British would have deployed their own their own Sir Humphrey Appleby to try and work their way through it, and it would have been an interesting battle of bureaucratic wills. Won't get involved in China discussion of all the things in China. I know this is going to remove my British card in so many of your eyes, but I don't actually drink tea. So, no. It's an interesting book, John Jordan, 1982 Illustrated Guide. It's, it's, I, 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 is it a reliable to the modern US Navy? Um, well, it's 1982, so it's, 40, it's 42 years ago. But it, it's worth a read. It's interesting. Kiwi 2 is not a museum. Biggest, the question was the biggest warship. Yes, but... Kiwi and Elizabeth II. Yeah, but Kiwi 2 isn't... Uh, she's in America as well, isn't she? It was the biggest one outside of America. 
and she's in America as a museum. Oh no, she's in Dubai. Eh. I thought she was in America. Which is the which is the one which is in America? There is one. There is one of the British liners is in America. Is it the Queen Mary? Yes, it's the Queen Mary. Sorry, I was getting the Queen Mary and the QE2. Why is it the city of Long Beach has preserved the Queen Mary? Not on American liner. Anyone know? Any ideas why? You thought they'd have an American liner that they'd have gone, we want to preserve. But no, they're gone, we want to preserve a British liner. We want something with class. <sighs> Maybe it's because... It, oh, is it because they didn't get the USS Long Beach to keep? They basically went, you won't let us have Long Beach. We're going to keep the Queen Mary and rub it into you. That is, that's it, isn't it? It's US, uh, Long Beach is getting its own for not getting USS Long Beach to preserve. I can't stop Um Who was there? Uh, uh, Sam Thompson. Who would be the naval equivalent of, to War Daddy? No idea. There are a fair number of options, but no, I'd, I'd have to do a lot of work to try and figure that one out. I'd have to know a lot more. I'd have to do a lot more about and study about War Daddy, and I'd have to check just how many children Philip Vian had. Knights of Knights of Three One. Were the surviving World War One vintage V and W class destroyers supposed to get? We got rid of under Second London Treaty. In London Treaty, um, not really. Check the Second London Treaty. You'll find. There is things being overage, but there's no definition that they have to be got rid of. There's uh, instructions for how to uh, uh, get rid of them, but not instructions to get rid of them. A overage vessel is any uh, for uh, for capital ships. The ships over twenty six years of age. Vessels of the following categories shall be under uh, deemed overage when the unmentioned years have elapsed. Overage does not mean you have to get rid of them. So capital ships twenty six years. Aircraft carriers twenty years. Light surface vessels, if laid down before first January, January nineteen twenty, sixteen years. If laid down after thirty first of December nineteen nineteen, twenty years. If they if they are light surface vessels subcategory C, sixteen years, and light uh, category uh, vessels category subcategory C are um, hmm, small cruisers, um, submarines thirteen years. But no, I'm going through and checking the lovely thing that is known as the Second London Naval Treaty. And there is no cumulative tonnage mentioned in it. There are individual ship tonnages. Individual ships, but there's no cumulative message, um, tonnage limit. Capital ships or surface ships of following cat of our war belong to one of the two following subcategories. Surface vessels of war, other than aircraft carriers, or auxiliary vessels or capital ships of category, or category B. Standard space which exceeds 10,000 tons, or which carry a gun caliber exceeding 8 inch. Uh, surface vessels of war, other than aircraft carriers, or standard space which does not exceed 8,000 tons, and which carry a gun with a caliber exceeding 8 inch. Mm. It's fun. But no, once something's overage, it's not counted in the tonnage ton ton limitations. Um. 
Black Guy 229. Is the Arlie Burke class the largest class of destroyers since the Venture class? Yes. In terms of numbers, yes. Black What if HMCS Neobe was preserved as museum ship by Canada? She'd be cute, but I don't think she'd be the largest ship. Let me just check. Um, no, she wouldn't be the largest ship. She's 11,000 tons. Diadem class protected cruiser. Nice turn. It was the conversion of the elderly World One Vintage, uh, World One Vintage V and W class. You keep saying elderly. They're not ancient. They were V and One. They were mostly produced. They're being produced at the same time the four stackers were. And yes, that means they are older, but they are still serviceable vessels for what the roles they were the second line duties. Um, was it a stopgap? And if so, it was what was a stopgap for? Basically, it was to incre it was a short term, short to medium term increase of escort numbers until you had the hunt class, and, and this was if they because it was being started in 1939, right? It was started before all sorts of things. Before you got enough hunt class and enough flower class into service, you wanted to have ships available, and so one of the quicker methodologies was to convert the VNWs, and that provided you numbers up. And that was before war began. That was actually started. When war began, that was carried out and up. Uh, Far higher state, uh, far higher speed. Which one? They have Iowa. I don't think they're complaining too much. Look, Verdun. They will complain. They want it. They want it all. Uh, Cartoon Man 154, I don't think Liverpool can outbid, outbid Dubai. I really don't. Also, there's operational research on how to use the equipment better, but I presume if you've got the tech, you've got the operational research. If not, you've hopefully done the exercise with it. So, yeah, the things, it might be more fun, it might be better to have it, but you know. You can do, you can you can get away without it. Yeah. And you still got the advantage that you've had far more exercising going on. Um but going, do you see any Tico class cruisers being turned into a museum or are they too new and have too much in common with current warships? Oh I'd like a Tico to be turned into museum. I doubt a Tico will be turned into museum, but I think that's more because they just haven't pa uh, they haven't picked up any national um really en enough national pride for them to be converted into one. I would like an LCS to be converted into museum ship and stuck outside the United States, stuck on the sort of the um if possible on that rather long sort of artificial canal lake they have in front of the uh, the, the Senate, etc. In, in Washington. Let me, oh, let me just look it up. And the reason I'd like it there is I'd like it there going, this is what happens when you have bright ideas. Please stop having a bright idea. Um... Going far too. Is oh. Alexandra, Baltimore.
Yeah, found Washington, D.C. Got that. Oh, caramba. And where is it? There, there it is, right. So, in the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool, yeah, um, I would like to stick an LCS there. Alternatively, I will take, uh, I'm quite happy for it to sit in the Capitol Reflecting Pool uh, in front of the US of his S. Grant Memorial, but I, I consider it a bit rude to him. And basically, the idea would be that from there, the United, uh, the Capitol building, they could see it clearly, and it would be a nice instruction of how you do not run a defensive procurement program. Please, in future, stop doing this. I doubt anyone will actually deli deliver on that, but we can always hope. I have to say, I have got Washington as one of those places I would like to visit and actually as a tourist someday and actually get to wander around. Because one of the things I find most interesting is that within sight, uh, across the way from the absolutely must-see, that is Ulysses S. Grant Memorial, you can probably see from there, I would like to see personally, you can see the uh, the Robert E. Lee Memorial, because I'm not really sad about that, but, you know. I can understand why he has a memorial. I'm just not sure it should be so publicly spaced. You could do the same by sticking Ajax on the plinth outside the House of Commons. See, you want to stick it on the plinth outside the House of Commons. No, no. Ajax is the right size. I think we could stick it inside the House of Commons. I think if we... I think there are places in the House of Commons you could stick it inside actually looking at them. With a little bit of creativity, mind you, I think you could do it. Um, Steve Clark, the discuss, discuss change in treaty time just allows cruiser carriers. How does it change the cruiser actions between the J the J Japanese, USA, and Royal Navy in 1942 around Garnet Canal? Depends if they've actually built them and how they've built them. Um, honestly, it means you're going to have ships which can, to an extent, self escort, but are going to be hanging back. And as I've said before, cruiser carriers like battle carriers just don't make any sense. Any scenario where you're actually building them, you're in enough trouble that, frankly, you should probably not be building them. You should be suing for peace. How does it change those uh, those actions? It's going to depend on whose ships are there, what they look like, and how they operate. And, again, that's... I can tell you what the initial designs will be like. But I can't tell you what the second, third generation are going to be like. And if the initial designs are there... We can work it out, but the odds of the initial designs being there, which are probably going to get a couple of built, versus the first, second or third generation if cruiser carriers are allowed, is very low. Um, and to be fair, cruiser carriers are sort of allowed. You can sort of get away with it, with the idea of 6-inch guns, etc., because carriers are allowed to have anything up to eight inch guns fitted and all sorts of things. So you could build a built a cruiser carrier if you want. It just would have come from your carrier tonnage. And they don't build them. The Americans do have their eight inch guns on the Lexingtons, but that's the Americans with the Lexingtons. Lexington Tower of Saratoga, just, you know, fun. Like most of us, you are tasked with creating a 1930s version of Yes Minister called Yes Admiral. How does it go and what actors would you choose to be represented by whom? 
Can you ask that as a patron question? Because honestly, I'd have to go through that quite in quite a lot of detail with photos. But I've already decided I want Tom Holland as the um, subby midshipman who's going around going, what the frigate is going on around me? He has the right look of pained lack of knowledge. Would I be right that World War 1 you do not see as many destroyers get built? No, you get a lot of destroyers get built. The British build tons of them, so do the, uh, so do the Americans. Pretty much, the British build a huge number of destroyers in World War 1. Huge number of destroyers. Right, the B&W class alone are... Let's see. The VNW class, the Royal Navy builds 67, they planned 107. They are preceded by the S class, which are mostly built in 1917, 1917 onwards, which they built 67, and they planned 69. And of course, there were some flotilla leaders of which they built 6 and well, pl uh, like plan six. Um, there was also the R class. Where many of those were still in service in World War Two, and they pl completed sixty-two of those, and they were preceded by the M class. Which had 85 completed. Um, which were preceded by the L class, which had 22 built. And that was pre World War I. Uh, the Marksman class flotilla leader had 7 built. They're preceded by the Faulkner class, which also had 4 built. Uh, Medea class, which had 4 built. Um, in terms of large destroyer leaders. The, basically, the, the Royal Navy is churning out a huge number of destroyers in World War I. It's the main thing that keeps the fleet going. Uh, this is my main point. Again, if you go back to the Battle of Jut Building the Fleet of Jutland video, Main point it is that the British are able to build a full fleet whilst also building more dreadnoughts than the Germans could build. The Germans have to sacrifice everything to build those dreadnoughts. So, Donaldson, do you think you're certain will bring the 18 Shordo back for next cruisers or stay with the tried and true 5 inch? Uh, I think first you'd have to get them to build some cruisers before you can work out whether they're going to get 8-inch or 5-inch. I would say the rail guns they're working on were 8-inch. I think. Um... If I remember correctly. Uh, let's see... Is it firing an 8-inch or a 6-inch shell? I think it was... I think it might have been an 8-inch. But I'm not 100% sure. I don't know why my brain is telling me it was an 18 Shiva. So I could be wrong. Hmm. 
But I do love the way that so much of the stuff around... The rail gun has now disappeared completely. It's gone very dark as a program, which means one of two things. One, it was absolutely terrible, and they've completely forgotten it. Two, they've decided they don't want to be public about its development. And considering the sheer amount of money they put into it, I'm not going for one. Uh, nice everyone. In an environment where destroy DDs are two to three thousand tons, okay. Does it make sense that the hunt class DDs would be... They would be the same size as sloops, so they would, the sloops would probably be bigger, because sloops would be up to 3,000 tons as well, because the sloop tonnage is linked to the destroyer tonnage. And if you consider the British build the sloops, they are building at about half, a little over half, so sloops would be probably about 1,600 plus, 1,600 to 1,800 tons, and honestly, the destroyer, the destroyer escorts are probably built the same, because they're built on the same hull. DA, the hunt class DDs are built on a, on a sloop hull. They take a sloop hold and they convert it into a DE, that's it. Um, sea plot. It's a bit geologically, but luck of the draw. Where the mineral resources are. If the mineral resources of Britain and Germany were swapped, how much in the 19th, 20th century have gone? Okay, so the Germans have a lot of forests and a lot of other things as well, but it, ooh, ooh, uh, not that dissimilar. The main quality is the quality of the coal. So the British don't have access to Welsh coal. They might pursue into oil even more for, uh, more sooner. Um, the thing is, though, the British will be trying to secure the quality of coal from elsewhere. So they'll be importing it from Canada and places which do have the, uh, have sufficiently enough coal, or sufficiently good enough coal. Um, so yeah, that that's that's going to be something which is going to have an impact on things, but how much of an impact it has is difficult to say. Um, yes, the Germans have better quality coal. That's great. That's going to help them with maintaining their speed and the capability of their fleet. But it's still not going to solve their other issues. So, yeah, it's one of those things whereby it's going to change some of the nuance, but it's not going to change the overall impact. Yeah, it's because of geography. And the fact is, the Germans, even if they swapped having British resources, they still have the German borders. Lauren Maximus, if HMAS Australia D84 is preserved... Who gets it on a it first on uh, gets on it first during the Australia trip? Um, if the eighty four was preserved because I was charging aboard vampire like an absolute insane beast. Uh, no, I'm, I don't mean I was that bad, but um, I was on there very quickly. Um, it would be probably Drac would get there first, and the things I'd be interested in would probably be the engine room, but also I would be wandering through the whole bomb the ship, and I'm um, trying to get down as low as I can go, as I always do, and um, the gun mechanism. And the same German interesting people. Yeah, that, that's the basic problem for Germany, is the interesting people and their geography, not their resources. Question 48. If the Russians had the two Lungosk and two Admiral Kuznetsov class carriers and five Kirov class heavy uh, cruisers, which would be in the far worst state? Um, probably the Kuznetsov still. Probably the Kuznetsov because the Lungosk were going to be nuclear powered as were the Kirovs and the Russians. The one good thing about them mildly is that they are mildly paranoid about their nuclear powered service ships. Mainly because they are their status assets. Although none of them were in great state, but because that's obviously definitely. Well, let's go, Bryn. Bryn stays out of World War I, Germany wins. 
Without an experience gained, I'm being able to examine German ships out of war. How significant does this affect British ship design? Um... Okay, so here's the thing. The only scenario Britain stays out of World War One is if the Germans haven't... If the Germans have given up on the naval race. And earlier. So if that's happened, that's fine. The British will keep building battleships, though. Throughout the war. They'll keep building ships. So what you'll see is the British keep developing their ship designs. They won't have some of the same problems that happens. And they will have enforced neutrality. You could have an interesting scenario come for the Germans because the British could enforce neutrality in the channel and say no fleet can go through here. Um, all sorts of fun things the British could do. Uh, to limit the... Uh, Germany could win the war, but could, not, you know, not win it as decisively. And also Germany would have to not go through Belgium. So that's going to make winning... The, winning the war could be a very interesting phraseology depending on how they do it. Uh, the British probably continue with their... Don't have the problem the 16-inch guns. There probably isn't the Washington Naval Treaty. Because if Britain doesn't join the war, there is no way it lasts long enough for America to join the war. So America's not going to get involved. Uh, which means you end up with a very different scenario. Um, honestly, you change the situation so much, uh, it becomes almost impossible to predict how it would go. But probably the British continue on. The British probably carry on their 19, carry out their scheduled upgrade in 1916 of infrastructure. So they're going to be able to build bigger ships. And they might well carry out the next one in 1922 as well. In which case they're going to be able to build even bigger ships. And if even if the Germans have beaten the French and the Russians eh, and have won, they've still got the same geographic positions. If they start building a navy, the British are going to start building up again. And if they don't, then they've got their army. They've still got their own internal issues to deal with. So it's a case of... It's going to change things, but how it changes things is going to be multi-layered. The one thing I did forget about wearing a beanie was beanie with powder on the head equals fun head. It's how do I put this politely? You've just nights ago when you asked a question about um, would the Russians have been better off by instead of stealing the because that's off, shouldn't they have offered to buy the ship from Ukraine? Um, could they have afforded to buy it from the Ukraine at the time? Uh, it was the most viable ship they had available, and frankly, it could have gone either way. It's Yuri Ostomenko who arrives from the Northern Fleet um, to get the get it, and without him you probably wouldn't have got it because mm, the ship's commander was in two minds as to what to do. But it does not have had a final pleasant career. Uh, go on. Uh, answer to go in the questions. Um, Carl Gusman, navalized army compatible 1.5mm naval gun in the foreseeable future? Uh, probably not. And the reason I say this is because, look, there's a fundamental difference between naval guns and army guns. Army guns are puny compared to naval guns. 
and when I mean this by puny, I mean what I mean is, so the size of round you can use, the cal the length of the barrel, etc., you can use on a ship versus a uh, on a ship is far bigger than you can use on a land vehicle. On a land vehicle, there's far more limitations in terms of tonnage, in terms of maneuverability, and all these things. There's also the whole system you can use to support a gun to maintain its rate of fire and automate it on a ship that you can't use on a ve on a vehicle. Let's be honest, most naval guns, especially de the larger ones, are deck penetrating and go down many decks. You can't do that in a land. So you go, I've got to fit the land gun, the land gun to the ship. Well, then it's in incre incredibly inefficient because it's this system which is designed to fit in this very small space, which you get on a vehicle. And it doesn't give you the range or advantages you can do. Yes, you can carry it. It takes up the same de it takes up deck space, just like the other one, but it doesn't really provide you the utility the other gun would do. Or you try and fit a naval gun to a sh land a land vehicle. It just, it, it's. I would love the land the naval guns to get a bit bigger again and get go back to dual mounts. I don't think naval ones are going to uh, naval ones and things are going to do it. I don't think it's going to be that sort of thing. Um. Nice to you, uh, Question 40. Wouldn't it be accurate to say that by 1990s, a lot of the Soviet Navy fleet has coming up to be replaced? Yes. It should have been, at least. Um, Mike Maximus, if the Neptune cruisers are built, do you think the British would have built a cruiser successor class? Potentially. Potentially, it dep if they if they've got enough crews in service that they've been useful for long enough, they will build. They could build something. It's if something survives to the Falklands War and proves useful, they'll want those guns again. Some people saying the rail guns were six inch. I could be wrong. It's just my brain for some reason saying eight inch. I couldn't find it anywhere whether I was right or wrong on that one. So I, I thought it was. It could have been a six inch, but I'm sure I remember it was an eight inch, or they were at least working with an eight inch design. Marcus, what if St. Helena was the size of the island of Hawaii, the big island, but still owned by the British? Um, let's see. If it was St. Helena, aka Ascension, uh, uh, it's a key island in the island area, and the Ascension Islands, if it's the size of Hawaii. Um, It's about 80, it's a, oof. it's about 121.8 kilometers square. So let's go to Hawaii uh, Islands. Um, the big island is... Ten thousand kilometers squared. Well, that's a big difference. I'll have you know. Um, One hundred twenty-one kilometers squared versus ten thousand kilometers squared. If Ascension Island was that big, a you'd have a far bigger naval, a far bigger air base down there, and probably a naval base of certain things. But you'd also have a far bigger population. Um, at this point, Ascension would either be a very large self-governing self-governing uh, um, British, self British overseas territory 
or would have been incorporated in the British state. Um, it's probably treated like Jersey. It's probably a British overseas territory. But uh, there's a possibility it's big enough. Um, what were the odds that the Project 115M Udloy add 2 and Project 115 Udloy 1? Mm, they were definitely going to be the basis for the destroyer force in the ninety in the nineties, but I doubt they'd have been its entire composition. Because the Soviets don't tend to chuck stuff away, and frankly, one of their advantages in having the older vessels around is it does create, at worst, you could possibly turn them meat shields for other ships, but it does give you um, some extra. Yeah, thank you. Nice to I do realize it's over four hours and twenty minutes long. Um, I will probably finish it soon, but you know, keep them going while I can. When we see your and Drax so TLD free paper, oh soon I hope. I keep no, I keep saying that, but we keep revising it. Um, that matters. What if the Neptune cruisers are built but with eight-inch guns? What is the tonnage they reach, and what is their impact? How many eight-inch guns do you want to go with? Uh, what age inch gun are you going to pick? Are you picking the Mark 8 or are you going for something a, bit, a, a newer version of the 8 inch gun? Uh, what kind of turret do you want to do? Do you want to do a turret which can angle up to 70 degrees? Do you want to do a turret which can do its uh, do, do, do the Mark 2 turret? Uh, you know, there are so many options there that I can't really answer that one because you're building a completely different thing than the Neptune class. The Neptune class is built as a, a powerful 6 inch cruiser. You know, um, if you are that you're propo you're going from a nineteen thousand ton in deep load light cruiser with six inch guns to something which is a heavy cruiser with eight inch guns. Let's say they go for a four triple turret, eight inch turret. Well, that could be require you twenty four thousand tons. The Trafalgar fight is going to happen. It's going to happen. We have a plan we have it's hopefully it's going to be executed it's the old thing it's we hope it's going to be executed anyway i seem to have caught up with the questions and as everyone's reminded me, this is now four hours and 25 minutes and i've got to do some building work tomorrow morning so i'm gonna say thank you very much everyone take care hope you enjoyed i'm going to end the questions in five four three Two, one, and I'm just waiting for that to appear now, and then I'll say goodbye to you all. That's the morning class, but with a third turret and torpedoes. The morning class, a fourth turret and torpedoes, mm, potentially. What was supposed to be replaced? The project. Uh, there are all sorts of options that they were looking at to replace the uh, Crestal and the Crestal 2s. They had ideas. They did have ideas. And Thank you, Runon. Thank you, Funko. Thank you, Debrock. Thank you, H. Vodun. Thank you, Alzazaki. Thank you, Bugguy89. Thank you, John Shea. Thank you, Ince Morrison. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, Knight6831. Thank you, Gorbian. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Carl Gasberg. Thank you, Jacob Betchington. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Steve Clark. Thank you, Peter Dawson. Thank you, C.M. McDevitt. Thank you, Costa Drazenus. Thank you. I think I said thank you to Funko, but I don't think I had to Cartoon Man 154. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Peter Dawson. Thank you. Who else is here? David Golding. Thank you. Um. Thank you, everyone who's been here. Blackmore Maximus, Joss Fonk, DG40. Thank you, everyone. Uh, last question got posted up here. Yeah. There are community. Uh, welcome to our Remember the guy. Uh, your privacy and abide by our community guidelines. Oh, that's always fun. Right. Thank you, David Golding. Thank you for work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Hope you had a nice time. Thank you for watching.
and take care. Doodles.